Have you always wanted to be a cinematographer or did you want to be a director instead? Uh, cinematography came to me kind of later and I feel like I stumbled into it. I um, di Directing was kind of always the goal. I, you know, I loved films and I loved uh, specifically atmosphere. I was always attracted to the atmosphere which when I was a kid usually meant genre horror, sci-fi fantasy, like the fantastical. Uh, and I was, I think that's what drew me initially to it is a totally different world. And then over the years, especially once I got into uh, college and grad school more specifically, I, you know, I was making films with friends. I was writing a lot at the time. Also my school was small, so doing film mixed with theater, so plays and all that. And the more that I did that, uh, I loved it, but everything was a little slow. Like you sit by yourself, you're writing, you're writing, you're writing, you know, directing, you have to organize a lot of things. You didn't really have producers at this school. And I started to pay attention to cinematography knowing my own thesis film was coming soon and there was nobody in my school that was a very good shooter. And so I just started studying that and other people started to ask me to shoot their films. And so I started learning cinematography really by working on other people's films and the immediate gratification of it became very addictive. Like directing, it would you know it took me months to organize a short, and whether I was writing the script or getting it from somebody else, it still took time. But you know, cinematography, it's just like okay, well, let's light the scene now, let's shoot it now, and that immediate gratification, I think, was a big turnover for me. I think I just got addicted to knowing I can make this happen right now, whereas writing, which I still very, very rarely. I still do some and I do, you know, I still hope to find my way back to directing. I miss directing a lot. I miss interacting with actors, not that I don't in my job now, but uh, in a slightly more intimate way perhaps. Uh, but yeah, it really, it was something that I never aimed for, but then it, it just found its way to me. So it's, yeah. But, I, but now I love it. I'm, I've, I've, for a long time, I've been fond of saying it's my second favorite job on earth behind directing. Uh, but now it's, I don't know, it might be 1A, 1B, because I really, I do love it. And I love the, um, there's almost like your responsibilities are a bit lessened. I hate to put it that way, but there's, I watch some directors and they're being flooded with emails and calls and texts and all through the night and for me for the most part assuming my prep went well enough uh, I the load is a, a little less and I feel like my quality of life is pretty good which is a sort of a sad way to say why you've leaned into something but I have found it to be true so yeah well some people know some people the idea of one thing sounds great but then when you actually look at what the duties are then maybe, you know, some people are more visual, some people are more, you know, this, they're better not even speaking, they just know intuitively what they want. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. There is a lot of... I've always loved cameras, just I've always been fascinated by cameras and so as a kid I loved picking cameras up and so there is something to be said but perhaps I just, it took me a while to just find my way to cinematography because of that because I just cameras were always a big part of it and I've always been a visual learner and all of those things so so maybe it was inevitable that I would find my way to cinematography for sure were you good at magic like I could see you being like a magic like person that's you know uh ventriloquism if oh, that counts cool. I yeah. was I was into ventriloquism for a very small amount of time but um yeah I mean you know I did, the, originally what everybody thought I was going to do was draw. I used to draw like crazy, r really into comic books. And so I just, everything, I would just draw, draw, draw. And then that turned into writing for a long time. And, but I, but it was really, even with writing, my writing was very visually oriented, if that makes sense, very descriptive in terms of, 
again, atmosphere. I think there's something about atmosphere that I, I, I have a mini obsession with, just creating the, the texture of, of, the, of a world is something that I love deeply. And I think with cinematography, I get to do more of that. And what was your thesis film about? Uh, my, it was a dark, it was like a, it was very much inspired by grim fairy tales. My, so my thesis was uh, a young girl whose mother has passed. Uh, at the very beginning of the film, we see her only as a, as a corpse. Um, and her father turns to drinking and the little girl gets uh, obsessed with trying to fix her mom. And so it begins, if I remember correctly, her dad says something like, to the effect of, oh, her, her heart is, is broken. It, it's, so she's not around now. And the little girl decides, oh, if I can get her a new heart, then we'll have a new, you know, she'll be fine. And so she goes around and it takes place in like a sort of fantastical 16th century uh, and she goes around and starts collecting body parts from various folks. So it's like a little bloody, there's a storybook, like a literal storybook. I had an artist friend of mine, Chris Henry, draw this whole thing. And so it's, it opens with Once Upon a Time, opens up and filmed it in the Redwoods in Northern California, uh, which was beautiful, great, you know, production value. And yeah, it was a, dark, dark horror comedy, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think I would be able to sit and watch it now without clawing my own eyes out, but it was, uh, I was very happy with the attempt. I'm glad I tried something strange. I think that's up my alley. Strange has always been up my alley. I wouldn't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first camera? Ooh, first cameras. Well, so when I was, boy, I'm gonna say 16-ish, I dug up my grandfather's old Super 8 camera. And so I started shooting with Super 8, but having no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what any of the settings meant. And I just, it's, it's thinking back on it, it's sort of amazing that some of it was exposed. I mean, I had no idea what, I was just, setting it in the middle. And so I did get a few rolls back that were just black. But uh, for the most part, everything came out pretty exposed. And so I shot some short films on Super 8 for a little while. And then uh, and then I think the, the my first camera, this would have been the tail end of college, it was a Panasonic DVX100, which was, you know, the first it was mini DV, which is maybe the worst format in a lot of ways in terms of actual qual image quality, but it shot 24 frames per second. It had, uh, I mean, really, I shot a lot with it. It was a lot of sketch comedy at the time. That would, I was, I've always been very into comedy. Uh, and yeah, that camera felt like a, uh, a step, even though I did, I don't know that I ever got paid for a single job with it. I shot a lot with it, which was great. And then, you know, from there, some years later, the Panasonic HVX 100, I think, the, the HD, basically, digital version of that. Um, I never owned that, but I worked at a company that had one, and they let me use it whenever. So, yeah, I think those were, those were kind of the big camera steps for me. And then with many others in between, a 7D, a 5D, A7S, and eventually an Alexa Mini. Do you still have the mini DV tapes? Uh, no, I, dust unfortunately, you know, it's a bummer. I, uh, about, let's see, this would have been 11 years ago, uh, my house that was renting uh, burned down in one of the LA, at the time, the biggest fire in LA and I lost all of my wow. films. I lost all my writing, all my art. I used to, you know, draw and it was, it was, it still, still kind of stings, but you know, truthfully, it was a big, um, reset button. I, I, it, it, it has helped me with, uh, attachment and having a lack of it. Uh, it was the year after my house burned down. 
I just kind of lived on the road for a year. I could fit everything I owned in a backpack. And so I slept on couches. I flew out to Hawaii and slept uh, on my buddy's hotel room while we were working on a movie out there. Like it was, my life was uh, a bit of an adventure, which I think was good, I think. It was, it was an interesting life for a time, uh, but the, at the sacrifice of losing, you know, all basically everything I had created up until 30 years old, essentially. Was this the station fire? Yeah, the station yes. fire. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was a, a strange time. Strange time. It's, it's funny to think that that's so long ago because it does feel so uh, relevant to my life. Like it really, I, I'm, it's, it's altered some of my way of approaching things and, and purchases feel strange to me still. Furniture and I, like owning things still feels a little weird, a little PTSD, I think. But, you know, I, 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 my life has been good since then. So it's, I just, one of the stepping stones, I guess. Who knows? Aside from it, you losing all these things and, and, and that being the, the horrible, like, negative side and, and losing, in a sense, your parts of yourself really mm -hmm. went, went down in that fire. Yeah. Do you think it showed you how temporary things are and, and you looked at things in a new light in, in a positive way that way? Yeah, I would for sure say the silver lining of losing everything is that you, the idea of impermanence becomes a lot easier to grasp. And I for sure, it's the impermanence of everything, life, health, I mean, friendships, you know, you just never, I think I take some of those things less for granted now, perhaps, I hope, I don't know. Uh, and I do wonder, you know, 20 years from now, what will the scars of that look like? Will they still be there? Will I, you know, I don't know. I moved into a house a year ago uh, after living in someone else's house for basically 10 years. I had like a wing of a house to myself. And uh, when I moved into my place last year, I owned nothing. I had no bed. I didn't have a chair, a desk. I had nothing. And so... 11 years, well, 10 years, I guess, at the time after the fire was the first time that I was like, okay, I got to purchase some things. Uh, and it felt, it still feels odd. I can feel the weight of those things. I liked, I liked the idea that at, you know, any particular morning, not to say I would do this necessarily, but that I could just kind of pack up everything into my car and be on my way. And that's everything. It's all I need. So, yeah. I don't know. So it's strange. I think I'm still uh, processing all of it, you know, in terms of its ultimate lessons. No, things do own you. It, it's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a weight for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. When did you realize you were obsessed with cinematography? Mm, okay. So I, w I was obsessed with movies very young. And I'm trying to think of when I became conscious of cinematography, even as a job or a, as a position on it to be honest i don't know i think i even probably ahead of cinematography is i think i was stricken by production design not realizing that it was production design because again i was so i've always been so attracted to the atmosphere being built and so often uh, the production design is doing especially if you're leaning into something fantastical you know, like the, the movie Legend was something I loved as a kid. And the sets are amazing. And I think that was the first time I realized, oh, somebody's doing this. Somebody's making this happen. But cinematography, I mean, I, I would think somewhere in college, and I think it's specifically that it was the camera side of things, since I had always enjoyed photography and just cameras in general. I realized somebody on set is touching a camera. And so I think that was the first inkling. But to be honest, I don't, it feels so gradual, my cinematography and I discovering each other. It almost feels like, you know, it's one, like a, like a romance where you're like, oh, we were 12 years old and we used to play at the beach together. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, over the years you start to be like, hey, she's kind of hot or whatever. And, and those little, 
flirtations. Like I, it just didn't occur to me. And then all of a sudden one day you're like, oh, I, I think I'm in love. Like this is, this is, it's a thing. So I, I think for me in college, when people started asking me to shoot their films, I think was, so being a cinematographer, I think was the first time I started to realize like, oh, I really love this. Because even with films that I loved, I was, while I was aware of cinematographers, it, I never thought of it as a job for myself somehow. So I don't know, it's sort of strange to think now because that's what my life is kind of built around is cinematography in a lot of ways. I mean, all the things I read about and find myself fascinated by, and I, I, I'm always paying attention to cameras and lights and, and light in general, you know, I'm, I'm so conscious of all these things now, but yeah, it, I really don't even remember where cinematography and I found each other. It's strange. Do you think because, uh, you know, you went to Humboldt State, you got like a double graduate degree? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I got two masters up there. And, and again, it was, so one was in screenwriting and one was in film production. And because our school was so small, it was really geared more toward a documentary and experimental film. And I, it really feels like a stroke of luck in timing. When I was there, there were other students who joined at the same time, a bunch of talented writers, directors, and all of us, were geared toward narrative. And because the department was so small, we almost created a path together. Whereas normally it was documentary or experimental, we kind of forged our own path of narrative, you know, with the professors as well. Um, and, you know, the experimental element really found it's I really loved experimental film and discovering like Maya Darren and Stan Brakhage these like you know gods of experimental film but most people haven't heard of them and I just loved it they were these weird esoteric bizarre films and I you know I made films where I was scratching the emulsion and coloring that and you know, conforming by hand and having physical negatives in my hand. It, I, I really dug that. And I think it's had a real effect on my approach to cinematography for sure. There's something very tactile that I lean into. I like, I like the things that I shoot to have a, a tactile, um, almost messiness to them. It's, it's interesting. And I assume that's where that came from, but I don't, I don't really know. Do you ever question, had you gone to another college, maybe they, they would have been more regimented? Like, did you have a lot of freedom there? Yeah, we had a ton of freedom in our program. And I, the first year that I went there, it was a fluke. I went, uh, before I went to grad school, when I was an undergrad, I did undergrad in Massachusetts, UMass Amherst, and they had a domestic exchange program, which I had no, I'd never even heard of. And the day I walked into their office, I just, asked like, hey, how does this work? And they gave me a bunch of brochures and they were like, oh, here's a book of all the schools that we have a partnership with. You could go to any of these schools in theory. And so I went to the library. I took it right then, went to the library, sat with it for a couple hours. And I was looking for a place that had film classes that was not in a city and that was near the ocean. And that was it. And it was like three or four schools that fit that. And Humboldt, which I had never heard of at the time, the deadline for that was like that day or that week. And so I went back, I had my little list and I went back to the, the woman who gave me the brochures and I asked like, how strict are these deadlines? Like if I wanted to apply to Humboldt, could I still do it? And she's like, you know, I'm not sure, let me check. And she goes into her office and she gets on the phone and she's on the phone for a while. And she finally comes out and is like, okay, you're enrolled for the fall. <laughs> and I, I was just like, well, I didn't even know if I wanted to do any of this, but I just was like, screw it. And I just went, I went across the country, I went to that school and that year changed my life. I mean, dramatically. It was really, I had been at UMass, they didn't have a film program. So I was taking uh, film theory classes. They had a sprinkling of those, uh, but no production. 
and I went out to that school and I wrote plays that got produced. I was acting in plays. I was making films hand over fist. Like we were all, it was just this, like I mentioned, there was there were these other students that were hungry in the same way I was. And I just spent a year producing content constantly. And because the department was small, we just kind of forged our own path. And I think uh, to, to your initial question, if I had gone to a school with more structure, I don't know how that would have gone. I don't know. Structure and I have not always been the best of friends. So I do wonder what would have happened. And I, you know, I used to be a painfully shy person and that year in Humboldt really opened me up. And I do wonder if I went to a, a school with more rules, maybe I never would have opened up. I don't know. And I had writing teachers and film teachers that I bonded with. And, I, you know, the classes were smaller, so you have the opportunity to bond. And yeah, I mean, I, it, all, it was, I remember that was the first time in my life where I started to believe in fate. I was just like, you know, I stumbled into the school and it changed my life. I think inarguably for the better, personality-wise, work ethic-wise, uh, opening my eyes up to different approaches to art and experimental film and all these things that I just, I hadn't planned on any of them. And then all of them really just sunk their hooks into me. So, I've yeah, heard it's a true. magical place up there. Very, not just the way it looks, but also the mindset. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm I'm more of a, I mean, I've been in LA now for 15 years, but I uh, I'm a nature boy. I'm a country boy. So up there, you know, I worked really hard, but then my breaks, I'd go off into the most beautiful forests in the world to take a walk and all that. And I think that really nurtured me and and you know helped my soul a bit for sure. What's the hardest part of being a cinematographer? The hardest part of being a cinematographer is probably, well, I reserve the right to take this back. Uh, and But I think, well, in general, I think time is always the enemy. So is, is trying to manage time. I think that's a, a big part of filmmaking and probably life too is just, just time. You you can never make more time. You can make everything else, but you can't make more time. And as a cinematographer, you're always going to be torn between, ooh, I could add another light or we could bring in some negative. Like you can always tweak an image, but the more time you give something now, the less time you'll have in the evening for the scene that's later. So you're constantly compromising. Uh, so I, it's, so it's either the battle with time or the battle with ego. I really, I'm, the more I work, the more I realize ego really takes up a lot of space on set. And it's not, and I don't mean just other people's ego, though I do also mean that, but really your own, especially as cinematographer, hierarchy gets very tricky, you know, on, I st I've always been a feature film nerd, and it's almost easy on a feature. The director's the boss, generally. Like that's so it's almost a cleaner thing. But the more TV I've been doing, it's my job to make sure that there are visual through lines. And sometimes you have a director who comes in and maybe wants to do something that isn't in the language of the show, and you try to balance like okay, I want to give the director what they want, but I have to also make sure that the showrunner that we're, or whoever, the producer, whoever might be the creative through line, that they're getting what they need and that I'm also making sure that we're not getting off track too far. And finding the places to, to curb my own ego when there are other people telling me that we need to do something that feels wrong or... Or maybe just I don't like, you know, whatever that is and, and trying to quiet my ego so that I can be logical about something like, okay, is this just because I want my idea to be right or is this actually affecting the, what we're working on right now? Like how much 
is ego versus, you know, the, I, something that's actually for the show. And I've been lucky that over the last four years, I've been working on a lot of series and just really going, going, going. And it's helped me, I think, I think if I had done some of the jobs I've had in the last year, if I had done them five years ago, I think I would have done a, a significantly poorer job because just because of my own ego, which I, I hate to say, but I, it's something that I've noticed more and more is keeping my own mind quiet while on set and learning to listen as opposed to talk and get all my ideas out. It's really trying to yeah, na navigation of ego, I guess. So time or ego, it's one of those two is the, probably the trickiest part of my job, I think. And this is going to go back to, to Humboldt State again, but do you think in some ways um, it was so supportive that when you came to another place that was maybe more competitive, that it was more difficult to navigate? Or I mean, I'm, that's just, that's my no. ego. No. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I think it's it's interesting because going back to Humboldt and my grad school, this is this is the one of my arguments for film school actually is to to be in a place where you can fail constantly, like like it's okay. It's not only okay, you should fail. You should swing for the fences and fall on your butt. Like it's I think that's important and it also, because my program was small and you were doing everything, it did give me confidence for sure. So I had, you know, it's easy to be a big fish in a small pond, but when you move to Los Angeles, like nobody cares. And I, you know, I was, I was shooting, I was like one of the only people that anyone would call to shoot a short up in Humboldt. And then I came to LA and it took me years before I could get anybody to let me shoot anything for free. I was gripping and then gaffing for a while and it definitely, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that was also tricky for my ego. But again, same thing. I worked with with uh, with a gentleman, Hollywood Heard was his name. Uh, I don't even remember what his real first name was, but he, we all called him Hollywood. And he was a, an older gaffer um, and he taught me a lot he and a big part of it was keep it taught me to keep my mouth shut because I you know I was used to being somebody who had opinions that people would listen to on tiny tiny little sets and he gave me my first work in Los Angeles on you know low budget features that kind of thing and realizing like I'm a small cog in a very large machine and watching people make mistakes that I, some of them I could foresee was very frustrating. He'd be like, oh, the sun is, by the time this track is laid down, the sun will be behind those trees. Like I can see it. And they're like, no, no, this isn't your job. You could, you don't tell them how to, and then I'd watch that happen. So, so it was hard to learn to shut up, uh, but also really good for me. You know, that's, I like to, when I'm on set, I encourage my crew to give me ideas. I love gathering ideas. It doesn't mean I'll take them, but I'm very open. I love collaboration, but I also, you know, I do my work. And so if something doesn't fit aesthetically or tonally, it's easy for me to just be like, mm, I don't think we're going to do this in the on Steadicam. I think that that doesn't quite, you know, whatever. So I, I think just, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it's a dance because in, in Humboldt, uh, I, my ego probably got inflated and then it got beat down coming to Los Angeles. And and now I don't, I guess I don't know where I sit with, with my own ego. Always working on it, meditating every day, and which is a habit I picked up um, because of film. I, I was on a series in Albania that was so stressful, I almost had a nervous breakdown. Like I had a really tough time and the director uh, meditated every day at lunch and out of pure desperation, uh, just to d try and do anything, I started meditating and now I never, I haven't missed a day of uh, a meditation before a day of shooting in probably four years. I've been, yeah. So that, David that helps. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for how long a period of time do you meditate? 
So I meditate, it's pretty quick. I do 10, the, my rhythm now is when I'm working, I wake up, I do my you know morning stuff at home and I get to set early and I meditate for 10 or 15 minutes in my car and then I get out, I have a little breakfast and, and then start the day. So it's 10, 10, 15 minutes every morning before I walk on to set, but always parked right near it. And what happens if you're you're trying to meditate, but then there's this little voice, oh, did I bring that? Oh, didn't I? Did I remember to? Oh, she, what, what if there's like this nagging voice about what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, I have, I've been meditating for four years and I've probably, I could probably count on one hand the number of times where a little voice wasn't talking to me. So it's just part of it. It's part of the process and that's fine. And, you know, I can always deal with it after my 10, 15 minutes is up. So whatever it is, uh, it, it definitely comes in and out, but the, I'll just deal with it afterwards. Usually, usually the 10 minute span doesn't affect anything. So yeah, I just let those thoughts go as best I can. What would your advice be for, let's say a young person who comes to a competitive set, it doesn't have to just be LA. And what I've seen with competitive environments is there's a lot of unwritten rules and you'll never, you're, you learn trial by fight. You know, you're yeah. going to find out that, oh, that wasn't okay, yeah. but you didn't know it. So what would your advice be? And they're, they're just someone that has good intentions. They're not trying to climb up. They just think that that's the way to do it, but they're not sure this is like an un, sort of uncharted territory. For them. Yeah. I mean, being on set is tricky for sure for everyone and if you're newer um i think i mean really i think the biggest piece of advice for anybody who wants to work really in any capacity uh on a film set is be kind and be humble like it doesn't like if you're if you're right and you're witnessing people be wrong like fine like that you don't need to express that like it's okay to just swallow some of your comments and just be I mean really film work especially narrative like features tv uh, longer shorts they're exhausting they're so time I mean commercial everything and you know once you get to hour 14 on day 26 everybody's exhausted everybody's stressed people miss their families it's it's a, a very film work is very difficult and the people who you surround yourself by or who you are surrounded by affect everything your mood your ability to think and if somebody is challenging you constantly even if they're right it it beats you down and you only have so much energy i think of it sometimes like a battery just being drained and if you have to spend five percent of your battery dealing with a personality like then that's removing five percent from something else and the people who seem to get hired more are people who are pleasant to work with. And I think that's something that surprised me a lot about Los Angeles, but it also, it just delights me. I never thought that, you know, being kind would help your career, but it makes perfect sense. Now that I'm on set and I realize how exhausting people are, Every, everybody, myself included, we're all exhausting. Everybody needs something from you know whether we need affirmations or whatever it is we're draining we're exhausting as a species so when somebody is easy and still does their job it's a magical combination and so i really i think everybody's eager especially when you're young and you're new you're eager to get ahead or i want like this or or you know or just chasing money or whatever it is i think slowing down and just being in the room uh, and yeah learning to read a room uh, that's the other thing so I think being kind and learning to read a room when it's tense you know maybe be a little more quiet when everybody's in a good mood like that's great jive along with it but being reading the room knowing when to be quiet which is just most of the time uh, I think that stuff all helps but really being kind, being humble, I think goes, it takes you far in life, I think. I'll check back in 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Wow. I like that story. So the guy, he he was, you said a gaffer or he was like a, mm -hmm. and he's, he was 
kind of saw you and said like don't don't do this and don't do that. yeah he really he he would get in my ear and he's sort of you know he's a big personality so you know i don't know i don't know i'd be i'd be curious i haven't seen him in 15 years probably so i'd be curious to see how he's doing now but for me i got frustrated seeing people with way more experience than me so i i thought i knew better uh and he was just like hey that's not your job like that's a big part of it is i had come partially coming from such a small school and small town you show up on set you you're going to do a little of everything sound lighting crafty like you it's, you're going to get your fingers in every aspect of it and being on sets there were still you know small movies but you have your lane and i would offer to help other departments and if they wanted help great and if they didn't that's also great like it so i think learning your position and knowing you can't do everything uh unless you know you are so there are some directors who are great at everything there are very few of them but there are some who are just very knowledgeable but that also tends to lead to micromanagement and people don't tend to enjoy that you know people want to feel like collaborators they want to feel like they have um some input on on you know have their fingerprints on a project in one way or another so yeah i think i think just learning to not just do, do your job and with a smile on your face if you can manage it yeah I'm not sure if you're okay talking about this but did you go through a period of time where you were not able to pay your bills being a cinematographer? Oh yeah, no, I'm happy to to oh, discuss okay. that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I so I've been in Los Angeles for 15 years, 15 something like that, and I was I've been broke for probably 11 of them, 10, something like that, like problematically broke for you know 5 6 years and I feel very lucky this is this is one of the things that I I'm always very thankful for is I always knew I wanted to be involved in filmmaking or at least from a very young age I I I didn't know if it was realistic my mother wanted me to be a doctor my whole family's doctors except for me uh but I just I was so I just loved it so much filmmaking the idea of it and any little taste I got that I was can I slept in my car my last semester of undergrad I slept in my car I went to the gym in the morning to shower like it was it never felt and it kind of felt romantic I never felt uh like I was sacrificing even though I guess I was it didn't feel that way because I was pursuing this kind of weird dream and it always and money I will say you know it's tricky if you if you're raising a family and all that but i for me it has always served me well to ignore money in the jobs i pursue and all that i have friends who are um who are doing well in let's say the commercial world or the corporate world in terms of filmmaking and they they will tell me that they're envious of me because i you know i've shot some features and tv shows but then something will come their way some you know low budget feature and they'll say no because the pay is no good but then they get frustrated that they're not getting a feature but they just want it. and narrative pays worse than commercials that's generally the rule and that's for me ignoring the money and just chasing the project or the director has served me very well some of the best some of the jobs you know i think about the last show i shot was pen 15 a hulu series and that director we've worked together on multiple projects we shot a series before for ciso which is a defunct uh streaming service and we did we shot a web series for I think it was like 3 days, 4 days of shooting. I think I got paid 100 bucks and I worked my butt off. And still to this day it's one of my favorite things that I shot. Uh I believe for him he got his his manager from that. It he he had a screening, it went very well. He it kind of kicked things off for him and 
you know, at the time when he asked me to do it, I did hesitate. I was like, oh, I think I, that barely pays. Like it's barely paying me anything. And then I did it and I loved it. I loved the project. I love everybody involved. Uh, a lot of those people are doing well these days. And it's a piece of my community in Los Angeles came from that tiny web series. So for me, and you know, we'll see now where we're in a pandemic as we speak and I haven't worked in months and I have, I was okay with it for a time and now the anxiety is starting to creep in. But you know, I've been freelance for 15 years and I'm used to all manner of ups and downs and I keep my overhead low so that I, I don't have to chase uh, money, I guess, yeah. Were you actively looking for jobs or because so much of the film industry just completely shut down? So yeah, now I'm, I, at this point, I have, the only thing that I've done to be proactive really is I have, I kind of, I'm not very active with social media and I realize that for my job, I probably should, I should make that a higher priority. And I do have friends who are really good with Instagram specifically. Uh, and I realize that it's at least potent, has the potential to be a good tool for finding work. And so I am now trying to treat it a little more seriously and trying to create posts that I would like to see, like maybe a little educational or a behind the scenes or how did you light this or why is the, the color palette this, that kind of thing. So I'm trying to now, just so I feel proactive because I don't really know what else I can be doing right now to find work. Uh, I've built a decent network over the years. I have a reputation uh, uh, that I am proud of. Um, but when people aren't calling, I'm genuinely not sure of what one does. Uh, I, and I'm learning. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm talking to different people and seeing what, what they think and, you know, just kind of trusting that something will come and you know, the, the last show I shot did well in terms of its, its reviews and, and find, finding an audience. Uh, so I'm hoping that that, you know, might, might put my name on some lists. But the truth is, so much of this is uh, a crapshoot. I really don't know how to find work. Even when, you know, a decade ago, I woke up every day and I would start on Craigslist and Mandy was a, a thing. And, but I was trying to do that the other day. I was like, oh, I'm curious, are people posting jobs now during all this? Uh, but I've never been sure how to find work. I've ne I've, it, it's never made sense to me, uh, but I have been okay at building relationships and not in an aggressive networking way, I don't think. It's mostly, I'm a, I'm a big film nerd and I end up bonding with people who are also film nerds and the directors who I've bonded with, it tends to be somebody who I met somewhere and we just got to talking about some movie that we saw and then it snowballs. You're like, oh, have you ever seen this movie and this? And just the excitement of it. And, and I think that's one of the arguments for being in Los Angeles is you are around other people who are chasing the same dream. And a lot of them, you'll find people who are nerdy in the same way you're nerdy and then you bond. And then going back to what I was saying earlier about how you are on set, that often starts way before, it, you know, it could be in a job interview, but ideally it's a social setting. You're meeting a friend of a friend of a friend at somebody's birthday and you're like, oh, I, I really liked that person. And it's like, what do they do? Oh, cinematographer. Well, you know, we have this thing coming up. And I think that's how a lot of Los Angeles connections get made. And I think that was the downside of going to such a small school is it really didn't, I came to LA with zero connections. And I think people who go to USC, for instance, uh, which is way more expensive, um, so it has that downside. But I think you are meeting people who are going to be in the industry 
uh, for the next decade at least. And I think that gives you a real head start in a lot of ways. And now I don't know in terms of film education and the debt or, or all that, I don't know pros and cons, but uh, I think, yeah, m meeting people, which again, in a pandemic is tricky. I have no idea how I'm gonna meet people, but you know, there are film groups that are meeting on Zoom and I should maybe try to be more proactive about that. But yeah, and you know, doing something like this. Who knows? Who knows who will who will see the interview and be like, hey, that guy. Yeah, let's try I like him. him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I want so. to meditate in my car with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so yeah, you never know. But yeah, yeah. I I I've never been good at figuring out how to get work, how to summon work. It's definitely one of the we I'm I'm fond of saying this, but I think it's true. I'm I'm bad at the business side of the business. So I see a lot that. of true artists are that way. Yeah, I've definitely, I know a lot of, I have a lot of musician friends and some of the best ones are terrible at every other part of life, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I don't know what one does with that, but yeah, you just kind of trust and, and I think, I think really the fact that I've been freelance for so long and I've gone through such lean times, uh, it, prepares you for future lean times. So yeah, so so far I feel okay. I think I think I told myself I'm allowed to get anxious next March. One year, at the one year anniversary, if I still have no work, then I'm allowed to start getting a little anxious. 2021? 2021, yeah. Okay. So, so I'm a little ahead of schedule. I got anxious for the first time a week or two ago. So I've gotta, that's not part of the deal. So I've gotta, I've gotta, Keep my because I know as soon as I end up on a set and I'm on week four and I'm exhausted, I'll be like, oh, remember when it was a pandemic and I could just <laughs> sleep whenever I wanted? So I'll be wishing for this downtime. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, if we look if we go back to 1918, mm. for was it the, the Spanish, the Spanish flu? flu? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, what was that? Two years? If we look was at it? the chart, I, I'm yeah. not I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, and if you think about Medical advances are far greater now, but mm -hmm. then there's the whole thing. Do we, does anybody want to take a vaccine? Right. We don't, you know, we won't go down that slippery slope. <laughs> but so I know that's the thing when, when you're talking about 2009 and, and station fire and all that, that, that was, there was a recession and that was yeah. tragic and we thought we'd probably never see anything like that in our lifetime again. And now you add a bad economy to a communicable disease. Sorry, I can't even say the word, yeah. but that, you know, is, is is so it's it's there's new variables that Absolutely. we've never really been in this situation yeah. before. Yeah, no, and you know, I will say, I mean, I think that's always on the table. I think you know, life is change, and if you, as soon as you think you have stability and a predictability to your life, I think something's going to shake it up. That's something, and that could be the fire speaking. Uh, but that's that's how certainly I try not to take anything for granted or assume. I think also, you know, the film industry in and of itself, like the number of projects that I was getting ready to shoot that then just fell through. I mean, it's innumerable. The I was supposed to be shooting a feature this summer that I was really excited about. I had three features lined up this year and poof, you know. Uh, but I, I've just, in normal times, that still happens. So I think being prepared for instability uh, in this industry is really important. And, you know, and weighing if that's worth it. You know, I, I'm lucky I don't have a wife and kids. And so my anxiety, any anxiety that arises is just for me. I would imagine for somebody with a family, you have to provide for, like that's, that's has, I don't see how that couldn't raise your stress. So, you know, it's a, uh, our industry is pretty cruel. It's, it chews you up, it spits you out. Um, there's always somebody behind you in line. So, I, you know, I don't know. I think that's why you, you really gotta love it because otherwise, <laughs> I do not recommend getting into this industry. Uh, it's, and, but I'm lucky because I do love it. I love it, I love it very purely. So now we'll see how long that lasts. I'm sure one morning I'll wake up and be like, mm, mm, I'm gonna go see if there's work at the gas station. Who knows? Well, you could. You said you love like ventriloquism and things like that. You never know. You might 
yeah. make a line of, of these puppets or what. I mean, That's just right. there's new things that could happen that sometimes we don't even know what our interests are. It's true. Yeah, you never know. And again, and I try to be open to all those things. To, to life has changed and it's all an adventure and, you know, tick tock. Who knows how much time you got left. So I think being open to any, any other experiences, any other uh, paths that, that reveal themselves in life, like, I, I don't know, take it. Why not? What the heck? So, yeah, I'm, I'm always open to to anything that might come down the pike. If I respond to it, that's that's all I need and then I'll follow that. When you look back at those times when, you know, you were trying to find work and and they were lean times, did you lose faith in yourself? Did you ever say, you know what, I should have I should have done pre-med? Hmm. Yeah, I think in my leaner times there were certainly doubts that came up, like, is this plausible? I mean, the truth is, I still wonder, is can I do this for another 10, 20, 30, 40 years? I, and I genuinely don't know. Um, so I think there have, there have been doubts in terms of, is this, is this a, a lifestyle that I want to continue pursuing? Uh, I've, I, I, that is probably the bigger one. I had a year, um, 2017, which was my first really busy year. And I shot, uh, I can't remember. It was like 30, 40 episodes of half hour, various shows, half hour TV. Like it was just, I went from one show to the next, to the next. I spent six or seven months in other States shooting. And it was good, uh, obviously, to be shooting. I was so exhausted by the end of the year that I felt really burnt out. And I got freaked out that I was like, oh no, like, can I not do this anymore? And, I, and I, it took me two months to recover, just sleeping basically for two months. I was seeing friends for the first time in a year. And it, it was the first time where I got scared of what can happen in this industry on the flip side. I was used to being broke and not, not having work and that brought its own anxiety. And then doing 13 hour days for a full year just ground me down uh, mentally and physically. And then, and so now I, when I have the luxury of, of choosing uh, jobs, I now pay more attention. Who am I working with? Is this really something that I feel a pull toward? Uh, and trying to weigh, you know, pros and cons of everything uh, because it's, yeah, I, I really don't know. I mean, I really have, I am scared of this industry. I've watched it take more talented people and spit them out and turn them bitter. And that's something I, I'm really worried about. I, I don't, I don't want that to be the case with me. I want to make sure that I still love what I'm doing for as long as possible. Uh, and, you know, part of that is meditation, making sure I know that. So going for evening walks for me is like a huge thing. It calms me down and all that. So uh, when I'm working on set on a, on a show, I have a lot of strict rules. I have dietary rules and sleep rules that I follow really closely because of that one year. I just, it was so intense uh, that it freaked me out. And now, you know, and built, so you're taking that experience and combining it with years of being broke and having doubts, but always still just kind of, okay, just keep working on your craft and hope, I guess, hope that something works out, but yeah. I don't know. It's it's really it's it's a it's all scary when I really think about this industry. It's it's a tough it's a tough one to feel good about, unfortunately. And I'm hoping, you know, who knows this pandemic? Maybe I'm hoping it'll turn into. Um, I've heard some shows are switching to French hours, which means instead of a twelve and a half hour day with a half hour lunch in the middle, is you you work for 10 hours straight. You don't stop for lunch. It's a walking lunch. And I would love that to, to go home two hours earlier is definitely worth not sitting down for a half hour for lunch. Uh, but it helps your immune system. You know, we're learning more about what lack of sleep does to your body and it's not good. 
So I do hope that, you know, be it a certain director or a certain studio or whatever it is, that quality of life maybe could move up the list in terms of priorities. I think that'd be lovely. I don't have a lot of faith in that happening, but I do hope that there's a way to be doing this into my well into my 70s and feel like I'm still taking care of my life. I don't know if that's possible, but you know, one can dream. We interviewed a gentleman who said that a lot of Hollywood work is like temp work. You're kind of swinging from one temp job to another, mm -hmm. and that it, it's never where you're really landing in one spot. Yeah. But on the flip side, you could say, well, there's a lot of people that had corporate jobs that they were just given a severance package and pushed out the door. Yeah. So nothing is really guaranteed. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's 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 true. I mean, I think the nature of most film work, or at least the film work that I do, um, is there just isn't stability. There just and there won't be. You know, I, I remember years ago, this would have been, this was probably 20 years ago, I saw an interview with Kevin Bacon, and he was, is still, I believe, married to Kira Sedgwick, and it was them, and Kevin Bacon, you know, has been around since I was a kid, and he said that after every project, when it goes quiet, he gets very nervous, and he's like, oh no, am I ever gonna work again? And I remember that sticking out to me, like, wait, Kevin Bacon? is worried about getting work. And now that I've been in the industry for a little while, I'm like, oh, right. Like, there's just no, you have no idea if you will be, even if you're on top of the world two years from now, you know, maybe nobody remembers your name or you shoot a project that bombs or, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's such a competitive world. And I think, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a good industry to base your life on if you want to build a healthy family. And I hate saying that because it is an industry I love so dearly. But having a relationship when you're gone, you know, 80 hours a week and you come home, you're exhausted. Uh, I don't know. You, you have to have a special partnership to make that work. I think it's very uh, stressful on all your relationships, romantic, friend, all that. Uh, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think mostly I like to put that out there. It doesn't, it, nothing is good or bad. It just is, you know, like, and that's just a fact of our industry. And I think it's important for people to realize that because it's, I think it, there are a lot of romantic ideas going in, but the reality of it, is, and especially now, you know, I don't know, will movie theaters open back up? Period. I'm sure they're going to open up in some capacity, but you know, our world is changing and streaming is now huge. I mean, there are more TV shows being made than ever in the history of, of Hollywood, but there are no more residuals, you know, almost entirely gone. Uh, and that's how a lot of writers and directors and actors maintained a career is that you were getting residuals from old projects, but they don't have residuals on any of the streaming services. Uh, so the future of our industry is very uncertain. Uh, but the flip side is, is if you, if you just look at the, the art of making and you know, between YouTube and all these shows on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and all these, there's more work and creation being done than ever before. It's just the money is the trick. But money's always the trick, I suppose. Sure. But when you look at your IMDb and just your, your body of work, it would be, uh, you know, I'm surprised to, to hear you question that. But with, I think that's a healthy questioning, though, just being realistic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's part, is not taking it for granted and not, never assuming that the future is going to be what the present is because it probably won't be. And, you know, I've shot, I've only ever shot one project that anyone has heard of and and that so I think I've shot 10 seasons of TV and one got you know it was a hit to some capacity at least for its size nobody's ever heard of the features I shot like it's 
you never know what's going to go in what direction. And so for me, uh, it's really important that I love the work, the craft, which I do, because you have no control over the other elements of it. And so I try to, when I, when I can, pay attention to who am I working with. The people make a real difference just in terms of quality of life day to day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you never know what's going to work or what's not going to work or what anybody will find. I've shot, I shot, I don't remember now, four or five series for um, Go90, which was a Verizon streaming service, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so even, even the full streaming service, the, the channel just ceased to exist, let alone those shows. Uh, but I loved the work and I'm proud of the work we did on a lot of those shows. I really, I hope they find themselves a home because some of them are really good shows. Uh, but again, I have no control over that. And so learning to let go helps is you just control what you can, which is on set, on the day, you do as good a job as you can, be pleasant to work with, enjoy it, because that's, you know, that's still your life day to day there. So yeah, it's weird. It's very, it's very strange. It's, it's depressing when I think about the realities of the industry. I tend to get pretty discouraged, you know, I, because I would like to, I would like to put some roots down, buy a house one day or whatever that might look like. And I don't know when or if or how that'll go. So, yeah. But for now, I still love the work. Like I get excited. I just read a script this week for a feature that may or may not happen and uh, in the new year. And it's like, oh yeah, how would I shoot this shot? And ooh, how, what's the look of this? I still get really excited about that. So I let, I let that lead me, but you know, I'm in my forties. So, oh, you are, yeah. okay. I. I did not know that. I thought you were much younger. Okay. Yeah, no. Oh. It's yeah, it's the years. You're sleeping the years well. Going. Yeah, I'm sleeping well. It's a pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Well, I gotta give you that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's other folks out there that are in a similar boat. They're looking for work. They're ready for work. Yeah. But it's not there, or whatever the case may be. How do you keep yourself in check? You said you have a meditation practice. Yeah. I mean, so I know myself well enough at this point. And I'm still learning. I haven't figured out all my quirks, but I know that if I don't go for walks, I will start to go crazy. Um, going to the movie theater has always been a big thing for me. I always feel very um, at peace in a movie theater, but that is not an option these days. So l trying to, I've not gotten myself out to nature often enough, but I know that that usually a few days of camping will usually kind of reset me. Uh, but how I eat and making sure there's some exercise in my life. I, and I almost take it like medicine. It has nothing to do with, oh, today's a good day to exercise or I feel like exercising. No, no, no. Like I have to because I will lose my mind otherwise. And so a part of it is really just being able to have the discipline, I guess, which for me feels strange to say because I don't think of myself as a disciplined person. but. For anything that, anything regarding filmmaking, I've always been able to convince myself to do something for the greater good. So keeping myself healthy for my own life maybe doesn't work, but to keep myself healthy so that I'm a better filmmaker, so that hour 13, I'm still energetic, that's somehow always been able, been a, a way that I've been able to keep myself, you know, happy and healthy to some degree and I've always struggled with anxiety and so I have these little things that I just know I need to do or you know I could lose a handle and who knows I just go crazy so, yeah. here's Johnny here's Johnny exactly <laughs> no yeah. I mean I, I mean I make light of it but I think a lot of we're all there in some way and because this is uncharted territory mm -hmm. yeah. and and we thought we'd seen the worst with the Great Recession and then there's so many aspects that we're just, you know, this is, you know, been a very trying year in so many ways. For so. sure, yeah. Yeah, and I will say, I mean, gratitude is a big, that's something I'm really trying to practice is just being thankful for, I mean, the fact that I shot a show that found an audience and that people like, 
I'm so grateful for that. After years of just grinding and, you know, it felt like I was banging my head against a wall and then it's like, oh, people like this. That's great and it feels good, but it's also like that's already gone. And so just to be grateful that something like that, grateful for my health, you know, anything that you can be grateful for, I think goes a long way. I think it's easy to, to spiral uh, in a global pandemic uh, in a country that is, uh, you know, pretty divided and a lot of anger and frustration. I think, I don't, you know, it's dangerous. You don't want to ignore anything, but is finding the things that make you, bring you some sort of peace and even joy, I think is so important. Remember why, you know, why do you want to live this life? Like why, oh yeah, right. Like. Hugging, I remember hugging. Hugging's pretty good. I'm assuming we'll do that again one day. So there's just, yeah, trying to be grateful for as much as you can. And you know, when I moved into my new house, I bought myself a really nice TV and I was like, oh, this is really expensive. I don't know if I should, but I did knowing that I had a show coming and I was like, okay, I can rationalize the cost. But now in the pandemic, I love that I have this huge TV and I'm watching, you know, all manner of things and it's a nice little treat and I can't go to a movie theater, but I have a nice setup at home, which I didn't have forever. So, you know, I'm thankful for that. Gratitude, I think, is a good, a good tool. Hard to exercise, but yeah. What's your favorite thing to watch on this new TV now? Oh, man, I, you know what? I've been really, I mean, I'm all over the place, but I... Have, I love watching a movie from like the 70s or 80s where it has this like beautiful film grain and I love watching the grain because my the TV's really nice and the uh, the blacks like go really black. So if you watch somebody like Gordon Willis, you know, a legendary cinematographer, his work, he, he really leaned into, he, people called him the Prince of Darkness. And you watch these images that are really dark, but they have this grain dancing through it. Film grain is such a, I have such a like a romantic, nostalgic reaction to it. So it makes me really happy to watch films with a ton of grain, dirt. It's, it's funny, I have this clean TV and my favorite things are the, the dirty images. I love those, yeah. That's awesome. Now, I love sometimes watching 90s, 80s talk shows. Mm. I mean, I love Phil Donahue, Jenny Jones. <laughs> there's just something you can't, I don't know, there's something very romantic about it. I know it sounds, yeah. really, but there no, is nostalgic, true. this like, you know, Phil Donahue and the hairstyles. and it's, Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nostalgia is a superpower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For anyone who wants to learn cinematography, what are some of the best exercises they can do right now? Well... If you're trying to learn cinematography right now, I mean, I would say take out your phone and just shoot images and try to edit them together. I think that's a, bi a big part of shooting, at least for narrative, but I would assume this is true of anything, but I, I'm more, narrative is my field, is the, the way a sequence comes together is a big part of my job. It's not just pretty images. Um, pretty images are great, they're really fun. But it's how, you know, I mean, you know, as something as basic as wide shot and a couple close ups, but getting used to that, watching, you know, if you're filming a person, this was a big thing. I remember when I started to learn this and working with, when I was inexperienced and working with inexperienced directors, and an actor would finish their last line and then they'd start walking, is directors who would always have me follow them, and then there was no place to cut. And I realized like, oh, but if you let them exit frame and then you cut right there, it's cleaner as opposed to a moving shot that then just cuts. And so, you know, our phones are wonderful cameras. They're better than the cameras I started with. So like I, I, there's no shame in shooting with a phone when everybody's got one. So I think doing that, but then yeah, on your phone, they have editing programs or whatever. So whatever is, whatever you have at your fingertips, use that but trying to learn how something comes together. I mean, I, I'm not super TikTok familiar, but I've seen some videos on there, and I have to say, it's pretty incredible watching 
some of the edits. Some of them are unexpected. It's quick. It's there's a rhythm to it, and I guess maybe that's a part of it too. Is the rhythm of how a sequence comes together. So I think shooting, but more specifically shooting and editing so that you see what doesn't work. Because it's really making mistakes. That's how you're gonna get better is by screwing up. Yeah. How did you begin editing films when you first got your camera? Well, let's see. My first, when I, f the first editing I did was Super 8. So I guess that was, you know, film and it was you had I had this little box where you cut it and so you're I mean you're literally holding up images and you're taping it together so I mean it's like proper old school which really makes you think about what you're shooting now with digital you know you can just shoot 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 and I think that can be I mean it's wonderful but it can be dangerous because you're not making as many decisions ahead of time and I'm a believer in at least doing things thoughtfully and then experiment off of that uh, but after that I, I mean I boy I think I've edited every which way I've edited on a flatbed I've edited film by hand I did uh, what was, I, I had like a, a sketch comedy show I did at my local cable access and that was editing VHS to VHS but you had to edit it linearly so it wasn't non-linear edit so it was you'd pick your shot from here and then on this other I, I, I barely even remember it I remember it being a big pain in the butt though and so I yeah I edited I think I've yeah every single way that you can edit I think I've tried and now I'm, I'm getting further and further away from it because I'm you know shooting I have a few directors well maybe not even a few maybe just a couple who involve me in the edit but usually I shoot and then that's it. I don't see it again until it's time for color. Um, but some directors will send me rough cuts and ask for some my thoughts and I love that because I, I consider that all part of my job, the rhythm of a sequence and how it feels, how it progresses. Uh, I'm, I, I love talking to editors, uh, rather directors in terms of editing. I think talking to a director about editing how a sequence will come together tells you uh, a bit about the tone like starting wide ending up close something as basic as that but the movement of a thing is the sequence going to end static are we going to do we want the whole thing to so so for me editing is very connected to cinematography uh, which is dangerous because often I'm kept out of that part of it so yeah how has the rhythm changed over the years? I know you'd said earlier that you were able to get a, a big screen TV and you're, you love watching the film grain of old movies. But how has the rhythm from old movies to now changed? Yeah, I think a lot about rhythm of modern film versus, versus older films because, you know, audiences are, we're, we're used to montage. We're used to, I mean, you, you see a, a 30 second commercial now can have I mean I don't I don't even know how to hazard a guess I mean it could have 300 cuts in it you know like it, it it but audiences are savvy so they can take that in the question is you know what is helping your message a bit more I have over the last few years and this is the influence I think of a specific director I worked with Charles Hood he is very aware of when edits come and he he has really influenced how I think of it is there there's some kind of a quote it might be Walter Murch and I'm sure I'm butchering it but every cut every time you cut you're letting the audience off the hook so it's sort of this idea of as you know a scene is even if it's just dialogue just two people talking if you're able to block it out in such a way or just a you know a walk and talk they're walking and you're just the camera's leading if you can let that shot linger it seems to me that you're more invested in the in the scene and as soon as it starts cutting and then it cuts and then it cuts and it cuts that it's it's being almost pieced together later and I do think there's something about that that I don't know it, it almost reminds you that you're watching a film or something whereas when shots are longer and you hold for longer which is hard to do because that can get very boring 
But if you can block a scene well and you know the, the actors in conjunction with the camera and they sort of you can land in a close up and then this actor moves here and they go and the camera moves, you, it's, it's a dance. And if that's choreographed well, I, I think that's about the best that you can do is fewer cuts. And, and a part of it is also watching filmmakers who I love, like Paul Thomas Anderson, somebody I love, one of the great filmmakers working, he does not cut a ton. He, he, let, he lets the scenes breathe. But that's, you know, that's not for everyone. It's not to say it's right or wrong, but in terms of keeping people in, in the story, that's something that I think helps. I think that's a tool that really helps people stay engaged, is fewer cuts. Now, we'll see how I feel a few years from now, but currently, that's something that I'm trying to get better at, is choreography. What makes a beautiful shot? What makes a beautiful shot? Well, beautiful is a tricky word. I think, um, yeah, that's, boy, I don't even know how I would begin to answer that because a beautiful shot, well, you know, there is a basic thing to, to me, uh, backlit, something that's backlit, if the light is behind and coming through, uh, that, that's always a good place to start. But beauty is such a strange word because there's, I think, f at least for my work, working in long form narrative, I think beauty is all relative to the story. So it's really what, what keeps you, my translation, I suppose, of that question would lean me toward like what fits uh, a scene. Like what, what, if the emotion of the scene is loneliness, you know, the word beauty is going to be interpreted differently. What's a beautiful way to shoot loneliness or a beautiful way of shooting madness? You know, and then so is beauty actually beauty, or is it? Uh, I think I think it's all just relevant to the story and the intention of a moment or a scene. And so, there are spots where ugly is beauty. You know, which I which I like. I like I like that it's malleable and it should be, uh, because you know, any director is going to interpret the same script in their own way. Any cinematographer is going to interpret it their own way. So beauty, yeah, beauty. It's interesting because I have a director who, Maria Mattioli, who she has an aesthetic that I really like. And so shooting with her is pleasurable because it's almost, it's just, it's almost the cleanest definition of beauty in a way. Like we've, we've tended anything that we've done together, we've just tried to make beautiful in the most, simplistic terms, you know, like beautiful people, beautiful places, beautiful costumes, beautiful light. And it's really fun to do that. I really love doing that. But she might be the only director who I work with where I, I almost, the word beautiful even fits. Everywhere else, it just feels so relative to the moment. Like what's the, the intention almost becomes more important than beautiful. So I feel like that's not much of an answer, but it's so hard, the word beauty for my job. I, actually, you know what I'll add to this? I was um, on Facebook, I have a few cinematography groups that I was part of. And I noticed every time I would get off, I would be on there for a little bit. And every time I'd get off, I'd feel really bad about myself. And it was because people were posting beautiful stills from commercials, music videos, whatever it was. And I'd look at their stills and I'd just be like, I've never shot a still that looks like that, that looks beautiful like that. And it really was getting to me. And then uh, I was working on a show and I was thinking about it as I was on set. And I was like, well, this shot, could we, it's not beautiful. And I was like, wait, 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 no, no, no. This isn't supposed to be beautiful. Like the, the last show I shot, Pen15, that was one of the mantras is like, no beauty. No, it is not a place for beauty. And that's, you know, we had a new gaffer come in for season two and he'd light a close up and we'd be working on it. And he'd bring in a little fill light or whatever, a highlight or rim light, whatever. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You, we got to get rid of that. That's too beautiful. Like if shots were beautiful on that show, we would ax them. We would, we would try and ugly it up a little bit. So 
Yeah, so on that show, beauty was the enemy in a way, which is tricky. That's interesting. I watched both trailers, season one, season two, and mm. it looks hilarious. I'd love to watch the, the full uh, show. Is that because it's supposed to show the awkwardness of like junior high or what, what I, I'm not sure exactly how old they are, but. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're in junior high and yeah, it's, it's a show about awkwardness and, and it's supposed to play real, you know? It's, it's a weird setup. There are 30 year olds playing 13 year olds with other actual 13 year olds, but we wanted to play it naturalistic and so you don't want like you don't want close-ups to look beautiful you don't want i mean there was nothing about puberty that felt beautiful to me and so that was a big part of it and so we we uglied up the image a lot we we added noise we we shot with no noise in camera and then we added grain and we would make sure it wasn't too saturated and it was it was a real dance but that was the the mantra is and that came from from the creators they were like we don't want a beautiful show we want this to there was a show uh, a movie that we used as reference welcome to the dollhouse oh, yeah. which is yeah and it's a great like 90s indie movie and that's what they kept saying is like how would we shoot this as a 90s indie movie where we don't have resources what you know how would we approach this and making sure to not make something beautiful because often i think that's what a lot of cinematographers think their job is is to make beautiful images and i don't think that's the job i think i think you're there to create help create a story and help hold up a story and that the the atmosphere that you're creating the visuals you're creating now that doesn't mean beauty doesn't belong there but it's it's in conjunction with the story where are the relationships where are the characters where's the arc right now uh, and leaning into beautiful shots that would be great on a reel, I think is a very dangerous way to work. Is that because you're always kind of competing with yourself and you're taking yourself out of the, the trueness of the story? In, t in terms of how do you mean? Well, you know, because I was thinking like cinema verite, you know, mm. you're going to just, you're not, you just want to show exactly what's there. Right. But so much of it now is, is trying to top not only your work, but other people's work, whether it's on Instagram or whatever. Right, yeah, no, that's interesting. Cause there is, yeah, there is, I mean, there is something, and I do think about this, is how to make something stand out in a, in a world full of images. And who are you comparing yourself against? I think I had, I had, I almost feel like a, an aesthetic breakthrough watching the show Atlanta I, because I was working in all these half hours, which I never thought that's where I'd end up, but I've been shooting all these half hour shows and I was struggling. I was like, how can you, like, I wanna make something that's cinematic, that still feels like I'm shooting a feature and how do you work that in? But I think, you know, then seeing a show like Atlanta and there was another show at the time, um, I Love Dick, it was on uh, Amazon and very different shows but both of them have a rawness to them. And Atlanta, the way that they shoot that is amazing. They're, they're basically trying to break the sensor of the Alexa. They're underexposing by several stops and then pulling it up so that they're pulling out the noise, which is the opposite of how you're taught and the opposite of how mo most people are shooting for clean and I want everything clean. There's a perfect eye light and a rim light. And then Atlanta came along and it's so, it looks like somebody, you know, buried it underground for a month and then dug it up and dust it off and like, here's your show. And I loved it because it, it has a personality. It fits with the, the show, like the storyline, the characters, they're broke and they're struggling. And I, for me, it really, I felt like it almost, it was like I took training wheels off of my bike because I was shooting these shows for people and they're, they're for other people, you know, showrunner or a production company or whatever, directors. And so I was like, well, I don't, I was like very careful. Oh, what about noise? People have a weird reaction to noise. So you have to shoot clean, make sure there's enough light. And then I was like, well, wait, now I want, I, if they can do this and this is my favorite show I've seen in years, then what can I do? for my shows that helps them and you know 
then I started to look at a lot older lenses and I started to really push myself a little bit more uh, in terms of not attaching to beauty. Like don't, don't let beauty be the leader. I think that became a big part of my mantra. Not to say I won't shoot beauty, but there needs to be a reason for it to be beautiful. And I find it interesting that you're not interested in documentary, or it's not that you don't like it, but that you're more drawn to narrative. Yeah, you know, I, I love documentaries. Um, I, but part of what I am drawn to with filmmaking is the creation of atmosphere. And I think in documentaries, you can absolutely do that, but I'm not as good at it. So I, uh, I have a friend who is a great documentary filmmaker and I like watching him because it, it opens my eyes up to the possibilities. Because now documentaries are becoming so cinematic and that to me is very exciting. You know, that people, the way people shoot interviews now is so much more daring than how it was just 10 years ago. And so for doc, because I do like the dirtiness of life and the dirtiness of images, I do think I've got some good docs in me to shoot. Um, but yeah, as of now, it just hasn't, hasn't come my way, but I would love to. Yeah. What are the basics of getting a great shot with any camera from an iPhone to DSLR? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's a little bit like your previous question about a beautiful shot, like what makes a great shot? Because it's so, it's so reliant on context. So, you know, any type of, any shot is what, where is this going to fit into the montage of images, you know? So, so it's place is really more of what I think about, but you know, on a technical level, there are certain things that I, will always be careful of, you know, seeing, uh, usually you want to see, unless there's a reason you don't, but seeing an actor's eyes is important, or at least one eye, because we, we, I think as humans, we connect to eyes. Even if you take googly eyes and you put them on, you know, a fork, suddenly you can bond with that fork. Like it suddenly has human characteristics. So I think eyes are a big thing to, I don't think about that consciously, but I know when I'm looking at a shot I'm shooting, figuring out where the eyes are and can you see them and are there other things in a frame that are drawing your eye as opposed to an actor's face, you know, that's a big part of it. So I think, Maybe the way I'd put it is, I want to know in a shot, where do I want the audience to look and how do I want them to feel when they look there? And so if you have a big wide shot and there's an actor somewhere, but there are other elements in the frame like a big turquoise teddy bear or, or a big shiny something or other, I want to make sure, and maybe that helps the scene, maybe that helps the shot, but I need to know what a shot is intended to do, the ideal is, and then I can work from there. And often you end up with a frame, you start with a frame rather, where there's too much pulling the eye, and I know this shot, you need to go to that actor right away. So that means we need to knock down this wall. This wall is too bright. So let's make sure and knock this light down so it's not hitting that wall. This, you know, these, sometimes there's something like an element of costume that like, ooh, in this shot, these red boots are too much. Maybe we frame them out, maybe we, but it, it becomes, I, I guess that's really what it is for me is it becomes about what's the intention and where do you want people to look and then you just start almost chiseling you're, you're you're like it's a sculpture and you're trying to get rid of the pieces that don't need to be there so that people are drawn to the piece be that through composition or lighting or color or size and frame uh, but I think that would be how I would approach it and then you know in terms of different cameras have different latitudes so like a, an Alexa has you know 15 ish stops of latitude so you can have your dark to your light but an iphone is significantly less and if something if there's a white spot that is blown out 
it was just no information and it that can it can be ugly and it can pull your eye because it's so bright and bare so there are technical limitations to different sensors and that also can be a part of it is just something that's that's less artistically driven and more technical and you're like well this this camera the sensor is going to break unless we knock down this light and shoot it all within a better latitude but again the intention is the same it's because you don't want them looking at the wrong thing and th and and having their mind you know drift to something else you you're you're sort of trying to be intentional about everything within a frame what is lighting and why do we light lighting yeah it's funny when i started lighting uh in grad school it was purely motivated by exposure i was shooting on film i started shooting on reversal 16 which is you know difficult to light and does not have much latitude and if you screw up it's gone and so i was lighting purely to have exposure so if you looked at some of the films that student films that i had lit um, there was nothing attractive about them but they were exposed uh, but now you know i suppose it goes back to like your question about a great shot or something it's it's intention it's always intention so it's trying to enhance whatever mood you're looking for uh, is be that something is you know beautiful or scary or and you know there is also um i don't know where this where or when this started but when i'm on set very often there will be and i don't know what it is and this is tricky uh is I'll be looking at an image on monitor and we'll be lighting it and it won't feel like anything. That's what I'll say. I'll be like, this isn't something. Like this isn't, I don't, what does it need? And, and sometimes I don't know. And so I'll go back to, okay, when, I, when I'm feeling lost, like a shot isn't working, I'll go back to what is the scene? Where is this character right now? And okay if this is the emotion what, what does that mean to me in terms of lighting and then you know i interpret it however i interpret or i talk to my gaffer or director or key grip and and i'll kind of talk it out and feel it out and sometimes it takes some experimenting but there is this thing it's not the best way to work but it's how i've worked for years now where we'll start futzing if i'm if i'm feeling like this shot isn't doing what i want it to do the light isn't doing what i want it to do like well what if we turn that off and and we'll, well what if okay maybe take away the diffusion there and then something will happen and i'm like oh this is something like i don't like now it feels like something it like has personality to it and it's such a it's really difficult to explain because the truth is i often don't know why I, I can't you know i do all my prep work so i try to um marinate in in a show's intention a show's mood a show's atmosphere but then you know when you're shooting shot after shot and you're on the the 1000th shot of a sh show that you're shooting and you're trying to find something and it's not there i really and I, I, part of it feels like a little bit of magic i don't know what that is but the light i'm very i'm always very conscious of light and sometimes it just doesn't feel right and i don't even know what that means like what is right what is, there's no such thing as right or wrong but something in me is not responding to what we're doing and and very often it's uh it's because of the light and so it's it's not much of a specific answer but that is something and the leader is the intention the intention of a scene the intention of like just just trying to think of where your characters are and sometimes a light can be too dominant or sometimes it's not enough or sometimes it's drawing the eye to the wrong place uh because it, it can you know ever, just like a door frame and a shaft of light like these are all ways to direct the eye and so i think for light it's it's just another tool another way to direct the eye and direct intention or mood i guess so a bit of a babbling answer but that's kind of how i feel about it sometimes it just is this mishmash of 
concepts that you're trying to hone in and then something clicks and you're like, yeah, that's what it is. It's weird. And referring back to Pen15, mm-hmm. your Hulu uh, project, the two, two, uh, one and two, mm-hmm. um, you said with that one, it was not to make scenes pretty. Right. So with the lighting again, you were not using any kind of fillers or? Yeah, it was so, yeah. So, you know, I mean, so the show's naturalistic uh, in general. And so, I mean, some of the basics are if we're in a bedroom, the light is going to, if it's bedroom daytime, and that's a big part of it. I work with the script supervisor very closely for a number of reasons, but one of them is I like to track time of day. It doesn't mean I'm going to always stick to it, but, you know, I always am checking with her. I'm like, okay, so this scene, is this like, you know, two o'clock? And she's like, actually, no, it's like five o'clock. And so some, I'm like, oh, okay. So then we'll, we'll lower the sun that's coming in a window. So it'll, and we let how it might actually be lead the scene. That, uh, that'll at least be, if you think of it as like a hunk of clay that you're shaping, you just getting the hunk is, is like where to even start. And that's often what it is. It's like, okay, it's 5 p.m., we're about to go to dinner with these kids, so it should not. So it should be a little darker. Let's start. And so part of it is smoothing out transitions because you know the next scene is just night. And so it's like, okay, well, you don't want to jump from noon to night unless you want to jump from noon to night. And so you let the the way it would actually be, you let that be the leader. So a lower sun coming in the side. And then you decide with with everybody, you know, the art crew and the directors, like, okay, these blinds, open, closed, it's gonna change the look in the room. And you can, intention should always be the leader, but sometimes you're just, you're like, okay, I don't, th- this is too bright. Okay, well then maybe we throw a tree branch in front of it, try and break it up, we, a diffusion, or maybe it's a cloudy day, you want it to feel like a cloudy day or feel like a sunny day. And these are all decisions. I mean, it's, it, that's really what a lot of it is. It's just a ton of small decisions that hopefully are being led by a concept. And then eventually you find yourself in a place that feels right. And I think that helps. I think that when you lead with intention and you know what the character's state of mind is at a particular time, it really helps because you can make tons of decisions. Are the lights on in the room? Are they off? Is the overhead on? Is the lamp on? Are the blinds open? Are the blinds closed? Is it cloudy? Is it sunny? Is it rainy? Is, is the sun over here? Because you decide, you know, was, or should we put the sun there? It, you can get overwhelmed by options but if you have places to start, if you know the story, if you know the characters, that at least gives, you can at least point your ship in a direction. And I think that, for me at least, uh, is huge. That's everything, otherwise I'd go insane. Because you can light any scene a million different ways. There were a lot of scenes where the, the two protagonists were in front of their lockers Mm-hmm. In sort of like the horrific halls yeah. of the <laughs> of the junior high, <laughs> and and sort of the 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 bareness and ugliness of of you know you're on display for everyone. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and that's and we debated uh, especially in season one when we were shooting locker scenes by the locker in the ugly hallway. You're like, well, you know, the light people tend to look better if the light is coming from the non-camera side. Just in terms of if you're just, you know, no, no intention or anything, it's just nice if it's coming from the opposite side. People, it'll be flatter if it's coming from the camera. And so we'd start to lean into that, but then we're like, well, but they're in the school hallway where they feel exposed and they feel like uncomfortable. So maybe that's actually good is that you do it what might be the wrong way, you know, and, and, and it's, you're juggling those decisions. And sometimes your intention is one thing, and then you look at it and you're like, well, it just doesn't work. And then you try it another way, and for whatever reason it works, and you respond to it. Uh, but I think that's also part of it, is being in, t- being in tune with everything and seeing what you respond to. Because it's just so arbitrary in a way, the way that I'm gonna respond to something doesn't mean everyone will, but you hope that if, if your intentions are dialed in, and that's what's leading your decisions, 
that's kind of the sum of all of those parts leads to it feeling the way you want it to feel, I guess. What is color temperature and why is it important? Mm. Yeah, color temperature is a is an interesting one. I so in terms of just its beginnings, um, traditionally now it's changing because of LEDs. But traditionally, uh, homes are lit with tungsten, which is a around thirty two hundred. It's a warmer color temperature, and daylight is fifty six hundred six thousand sunlight uh, color temperature, which is bluer. And so that's kind of the general starting point, I would say, for color temperature. 3200 is tungsten, which traditionally is home interior, and uh, 56 is 5600 is sunlight and outdoors, which is bluer. And then from there, there's everything. And so, you know, I was fond for a while uh, of shooting scenes. Uh, that that were like if we we're inside in the daytime and there were a couple lamps on I would shoot I shot a, a I think two whole series the whole thing basically the whole thing at 4400 uh, camera setting and so that meant every lamp was a little warm and all daylight was a little cool and I really there's just something about that that I really like but now the last couple years for whatever reason the projects I'm on or if it's my own personal aesthetic I don't really know uh, I've gotten more conscious of trying to match and choose any pops of color very carefully so if you're shooting inside and it's well evening so evening can be a tricky time to try and light because it's like oh you know in your life there's a point where you're in your house where you turn on the lights, like where it's getting a little too dark, but there's still light coming in. And so figuring out if you're in a scene, again, intention is the leader is do you want it to feel very cozy in the house? And maybe you're gonna shoot, if you shoot right at 3200, then everything in the house will feel quote unquote normal. But then that little blue light coming in will feel a little extra blue. Or you can say, oh, this is the, that transition and it was just afternoon and now we're starting to feel uh, like the evening is coming on and there's still that twinge of daylight outside. So we're gonna stay at 5,000 in camera, let's say, and then you turn on the lights in the house and it's very warm and then that feels new or different. So there are ways to play it that give just this edge of some kind of emotion one way or another like and so that I think that's the easiest way to talk about how to start with it but you can also make all of your lights all one color temperature and then everything is just even but color contrast is something that more and more I'm becoming very conscious of is if you want something to feel very blue, then sometimes it helps to have something orange because you need that contrast, which is very interesting because if you start watching scenes that are just blue, 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 every over and over and over, your eyes, our eyes are pretty incredible and they will adjust very quickly. And so that blue, the same exact blue, if you watch it for five minutes, by the time you're at that fifth minute, is gonna feel white because we adjust very quickly. But if you hold color contrast somewhere, a little orange or whatever that is, you keep the eyes anchored in a way. And so that that's something that uh, I, I really, I've always been conscious of, but I worked with a colorist who uh, season one of Pen15, he brought an element of color contrast that I think really helps that first season. Season two is kind of a different look. But season one, he was he started adding a little bit of blue to our shadows and to kind of contrast with skin tones and some of the production design. And I loved it, but it's nothing I intended going in. And that ended up coming in during our first week of shooting. He was there helping us create LUTs. So, you know, co color temperature is one of the big tools for sure. I mean, color, 
of any kind and color temperature is pr where it begins because every and especially now uh using leds you can dial in mi literally millions of colors and so you know what do you do with that that's a lot of power and a lot more uh decision making so it's yeah it's a it's a it's a dance and it's a tricky dance for sure you can go too far or you can go not far enough so yeah well if you go too far does that make it look too you know artsy and then it takes you out of you know especially when you talked about in the high, the halls of the junior high it seemed wanted to be more stark and like oh wow everybody's on display here right good and bad yeah well so again it goes back to what's the intention of a of the project you know because there are there are shows I would love to shoot a show with a ton of color I did a show that was kind of a mockumentary years ago it was about these DJs and so because it was DJs these really rich guys with not great taste and they're living this big DJ world we were using color all over the place and it was a blast it was really fun uh, but that we did that because it enhanced the 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 feeling in the world whereas pen 15 there wasn't the color really is in the um, costumes the costumes are very colorful in pen 15 and the bedrooms of the of the girls are a ton of color in there and so for me it became about letting the lights be a little more natural and just using colors to dictate time of day mood or enhance or bring back skin tones that kind of thing uh, but yeah the color of those shows because they, they are colorful shows but my end is not colorful at all we were draining color out very often so it, it's it's a because that's another part of it is production design costumes the actors themselves like what are their skin tones these are all pieces of the puzzle and you're trying to make it all kind of fit and not be you know make it consistent and no no one element overwhelming another like it's it's like a soup you know if you put too much ginger in a soup then suddenly it overwhelms everything else so yeah zoom versus primes which are better <sighs> yeah there's so zoom lenses and prime lenses they both have pros and cons uh for sure and um, it's a big it's a big subject um, traditionally zoom lenses are slower so uh, meaning you can't let as much light in or they need you to have more light um, whereas prime lenses this is not a rule it's just traditionally it's how it lays out so prime lenses tend to be faster so you know in terms of a t-stop or an f-stop you can open up more uh, and let and have a shallower depth of field let more light in um, but you a prime lens you know is like a 25 millimeter and that's all it is it's 25 is a 25 whereas a zoom let's say because there's also a huge range of zooms you can have a 25 to 78 or you can have a 25 to 250 and when these lens you know and some of these zooms are huge so there's a there's a lot of decision making that goes into what lenses you're using and the prime versus zoom is one of the big ones uh, there's also speed so if you're shooting on um, let's say a reality tv show you pretty much have to have a zoom lens because you need to be able to go in and it doesn't mean you're zooming in during a shot though it could but it also just to reset is you know you have a wide shot and then you adjust your body however you can but you don't want to be in the way so if you want to get a close-up on a reality show you just zoom in from where you are uh, that's kind of like the the very broad strokes but there's a lot you know the like a dolly move versus a zoom in they have a different feel to them and what's happening to the background is very different and where, where your character or your subject in space the way a zoom as you zoom in it tends to it flattens the image whereas if you're on a prime if you're on a 35 millimeter and you're moving in everything is still staying you're, you're able to isolate characters more so there are a lot of qualities that they're so difficult to see and feel and I'm very lucky because last five years I've been shooting so much 
So now I am at a place where a 20, what a 24 millimeter does to a, you know, let's say a medium close up shooting that if you shoot this on a 24 millimeter from right here, and then you move it back just six inches and you put on a 28 millimeter. I, for me, there's a big difference between the two, but it's taken just hours, you know, so, I have so many hours on set and, and looking through different lenses and watching their effect is what it does to the image. Some of it you can explain, like if I'm moving my hands and I'm on a 25 millimeter, it's gonna be exaggerated. My face will be a little rounder. What does that mean? It makes me feel maybe a little more silly or a little more cartoonish. But if you move back, and even though the, the, the top and bottom of the frame are exactly the same, on a 50 millimeter, none of those things are exaggerated anymore. It's almost a little like a 50 would be normal. And so that becomes a tool. And so then within that, you're, you're deciding like a prime versus a zoom, what is worth, what are your trade-offs? Because on a zoom, you can reset really quickly. But primes tend to have more character to them or be cleaner or, you know, so the, it's, it's all pros and cons. And, and it's, you know, it's just like, if you're, if you're grabbing, grabbing paints, if you're painting your house, you know, and they have those swatches, there's like yellow, but really it's like, this is Goldilocks, this one's Dandelion, this, and they have such subtle differences, but there are differences. And that's what lenses kind of bring. They all have different characteristics and zoom and prime are the two big categories. But then even within that, there are a number of different things that will differentiate one from another. And, and you know, time, money, resources are part of that decision. It's not all purely aesthetic. A lot of it is like, well, we won't have time to change primes or whatever, like we need to be able to hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. What's a, what's a good starting lens aside from like sort of the stock camera lens that's going to come with the body? What would you recommend if somebody wants to upgrade just a little bit? Yeah. I mean, well, so I think, you know, choosing a lens, if you're starting, if you could only start with one lens, one size, and this is assuming because different cameras have different size sensors. So a 35 millimeter lens does, the lens is always the lens, but if your sensor, like our phones have a very small sensor. So a 35 millimeter on the, well, that's maybe a bad way to start that. A 35 millimeter is always, the lens is the lens. But if you have a large sensor, then a 35 millimeter plays very wide. And if you have a smaller sensor, then a 35 millimeter plays a little tighter. So your camera, but the sort of standard size is super 35 is for a sensor. So that's what most things are. And I would say, assuming you have one of the more common cameras, that I would choose between a 35 or a 50 as the, I would lean 35, but I know most people would lean 50. Um, and I think that's because they're close-ish to our vision, or at least that's how people say. Because really, in reality, if you pay attention, I'm looking at you, but I'm, I can see my peripheral vision is pretty wide. So you could argue, oh, that's a 25 millimeter but my attention is really on you. And you could argue that that means that I'm not really watching the outskirts. And so really that's a 50 millimeter. And so it's, it's you know, it depends. Now for me, a 35 millimeter is a really nice size because you can shoot a wide and you can shoot a close up. But if you get in close on a 35, it does have a little roundness to it. So it's, yeah, maybe, maybe the answer is a 42, which is a hard lens size to find. But yeah, I think th those are the normal hero sizes, I would say, is a 35 and a 50, I think would be the two sizes that one would start with, I think. What's the best way to take care of the lenses so they're not scratched? 
different elements. Yeah. If you're working with sand. For sure. Yeah. Lenses require a lot. I mean, you need to treat lenses like a like a baby. Like they are, they are, even though a lot of them are built very rugged, the glass is glass. And so, you know, I'm very lucky. I have a great camera team. And so I rarely touch a lens. You know, my first AC, second AC, they bring it on, they take everything out, they're they're, you know they take everything out with care. They've, they're have they also professionals. They've been doing it for years. So, But you do need to treat a lens. You need to be constantly looking at when you take it off and you put it on, you need to check both sides up against the light because dust particles get in there. And if a dust particle is in the wrong part of frame, it will affect your image, sometimes dramatically. So you really need to take care of them. Um, some people will have a... Uh, a UV filter, which is basically just clear glass. It does a li- it functionally, it does serve a bit of a purpose, but really uh, I did that for a long time. I've gotten a little away from it now, uh, but I have a set of Rokinons, which are cheap lenses, uh, but I think the best bang for the buck. They don't have a ton of personality, but they are really good for their price, like a Rokinon lens. And you can get ones that have gears on them so if you're using a follow focus and those are like i think for a and they're really fast really fast uh i think they're like 200 bucks for a lens and for a good lens with gears on it that's really fast uh i think that's the the best lens you can get in terms of somebody beginning uh and i would just choose one of those if you can uh and yeah i think that's I think that's where I'd start. I still have mine and they used to have those filters on top in terms of protecting them. But now that I'm more comfortable and I'm like, I'm probably not going to screw this thing up. I I don't have them live on there. But you know, if you're shooting out in the woods or shooting at the beach or in the desert is a nightmare for lenses and for camera sensors. It just gets in gears, it gets in the fan and you, you, everything needs to be protected. And sometimes that's putting plastic or, or fabric around it and yeah, film equipment, strong as it is, you still need to treat it very gently. How long did it take you to fully grasp all the camera settings? I, you know, there are a lot of cameras that I couldn't run. Actually, most cameras I couldn't run by myself at this point. I don't, I am, uh, I am, hmm. I'm very reliant on my camera team, for sure. Uh, I am always familiar with how different camera sensors react to light and color, skin tones, the noise floors. Like I I pay attention to the sensor and the reactivity, uh, but often I am not familiar with building out a full camera with its wireless follow. I I couldn't put together a wireless follow focus. And my camera team, I'm so reliant. I'm reliant on them for a number of things. But for sure, they, like my first AC, Bryant, uh, I've been working with him for years. I'm reliant on him for putting together our camera. Even when we're ordering equipment, I do broad strokes. I'm like, I want these lenses, these filters. Uh, I prefer this monitor. But in terms of the cables and all the little, the follow focus, the, our wireless, like I, I have some leanings, but really, I leave that to him and it becomes, it's a big, your camera team ends up becoming a huge part of your whole process. And I'm for sure that way. And letting go of some of the technical uh, elements was tricky for me because I felt like, well, wait a minute, I'm the cinematographer. I'm supposed to know everything. And I was like, oh no, 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 no. I need to know how the image will end up, how we get there and the gear that's on the camera. if some of it matters to me because I have, you know, if I know it's handheld, I'm going to have different needs as opposed to if I know I'm going to be on dolly and all that. But uh, yeah, in terms of the, you know, the settings or switching things over to, you know, I mean, now the Alexa Mini, I've been shooting with that camera predominantly for the last few years. I'm very familiar with that um, just because of the number of times. But you know, if I were shooting on, let's say, a Sony Venice or or a Red, it's been a while since I've shot on a Red. Uh, I would probably need help 
changing the color temperature or the ISO or its frame rate or all that. And I, I have no problem asking for help with that stuff. I don't, I don't feel like that's part of my job description. I need to understand it. I need to understand where, what I'm looking to get out of it. But getting there, I'm content to let my ACs help guide me. What technical part of the craft took you the longest to learn? Yeah, the technical, because the cinematography really is technical. And actually, I, there's a feature that I may be shooting, you know, who knows now, but uh, that we might shoot on film. And I am excited, but also very nervous about it because I have, I was trained up on film, but to light boldly or dramatically for film is much scarier than for digital because with all our cameras now, we have a monitor and you can see what the image is going to look like right now. On film, you can't do that. You're, you have your light meter out and you're talking about like contrast ratios and how much light is here versus here and where you can, you know, I'm now used to, I light off of my monitor. I almost never, I bring a light meter to set. I almost never touch it. I'm really using the monitor. And to go back to film scares me a little bit because I want to make sure I can still be bold with my choices, but I have to make sure that it's not too contrasty or too, you know, too flat. Like I don't, it, it's really, so I think it's funny, in a way, the thing that now intimidates me or makes me nervous on the technical side is the thing that I learned first. And we've just, because of technology, have gotten away from that. And now to go back to it, I'm like, oh, I don't have the safety of knowing what my image is going to look like right away. You're kind of, you have to go back to your own faith and understanding the latitude of a film stock and contrast ratios, how it reacts to color. So I think that's the thing that right now probably makes me the most nervous on a, on a technical level. But, you know, there are, I think there's also, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things like how do bit rates and, you know, uh, 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 like a lot of our DSLRs for their color, it's like 422 and I'm used to shooting 444 on an Alexa Mini. And for a long time, I had no concept of what that is. And now I understand, oh, this is like the, the way it captures color. And why that's important to me is because it allows for gradation between like different like blues in a sky. Like the, it starts usually by the horizon. It's a little gray, gets a little bluer, and then deeper blue as you go up. And different camera sensors can't handle that because of the way they capture color. So I didn't, it, that isn't something that I ever learned because I was interested in the technical, but I was interested in like, well, why, why am I not getting the smoothness of a color transition? So that stuff has come to me kind of just by shooting. It's not like I sat and was studying books and got it that way. It's just kind of, learning because of really broken images and how do I not break this image next time that kind of thing were you one of these kids that used to take things apart to see how they worked uh you know I I was always curious so I would take things apart but not to see how they worked I would take things apart because I was just like I wonder what the inside of this looks like sounds like a serial killer <laughs> um, but yeah no I I actually I would not call myself a technical cinematographer. Now, I, that might not be true. I may actually be, and I realize sometimes, like, oh, I know more stuff than I thought. But I never, the leader of it is always, like, how does this image feel? Like, I look at when new cameras get announced, I will look at the specs. But what I've learned is that, like, listing the specs on paper kind of don't matter to me. Now, they give me a baseline. They help me understand frame rates. How will it do in low light? What is its native ISO? Like there are technical things that I now am very familiar with and I understand what that means. But really, I need to look at footage because the way that they capture motion, the way that they capture skin tones, the way that they capture, like the highlights, the way they blow out, like those are, so my, my 
technical, the technical information of cameras has always been secondary to the, my aesthetic reaction to it, my emotional reaction to the image for sure. Yeah, I think you probably do know a lot more than you think, but that maybe goes along with the humility, so. Well, I also think it's just years of doing it. Like mm -hmm. some of it just has has come because I've, I haven't understood why something is a certain way and so it's out of necessity, but yeah, I would say out of necessity. Like I'm just like, what is, what is this? And so I've, and I, but I've really, I've been in it for so long. So it, it's, yeah, I think that knowledge has just come almost through osmosis, just through wading through it for so long. Do you prefer more setups and shots or less setups and shots for a project? Yeah, I would, the fewer setups, generally the happier I am. Um, that's not to say that's always the right way, but I do notice there's, there's you know, if I'm, um, if we're hosing down a scene, uh, meaning, okay, we need a wide, and then maybe we get a second wide from here, and then we need this medium, and then let's go in for the close up, but then also let's, I don't enjoy that. Um, I feel like you're just chasing, and you're basically gathering um, pieces so that they can make it in an edit, so that in the edit, so really, and this happens with a lot of projects, they're basically creating it in the editing room, and nothing wrong with that, but for me personally, uh, that doesn't interest me that much. I wanna feel like we're making conscious decisions uh, on set, and also the fewer, the, the this is what I tell directors a lot too, is the fewer the number of shots, the higher the quality. So the more shots you're shooting, the lower the quality each shot will be, just out of necessity, you know, like you, you can't make it. And so for me, trying to be uh, intentional about why you're shooting, don't just shoot a close-up because you need a close-up in every scene. Like maybe we save this, then it's more powerful when you use a close-up in the next scene. Is, is being intentional about how it goes is very important to me. Because otherwise I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I feel like anybody could do it and that's fine. I'm not super interested in that. Uh, so yeah, so for me, the fewer the setups, oh man, I'd love to shoot just like a couple shots a day. I might get bored if that were actually the case, but that implies to me that we're really structuring something and you're moving, the camera moves when it needs to move and it will become an over the shoulder, you know, like that that these things progress and grow uh, and a shot can be multiple things in one setup. That's, that's something I really love. It's hard, but uh, I think it really plays beautifully in the end if you approach it that way. You use intention a lot. Is that, was that from the four agreements? Do you know that oh, book? Oh, that is, I, I read that. I read that when I was going through a bad breakup some oh, years okay. ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, is that, be intentional with your word, I think, or something, is that one of them? Why, um, is it Don Luis Miguel? Or forget, forgive yeah, me for yeah. the author's name, but I thought that that was part of the, the book, but I could be wrong, that it was about the power of intention and the intention of our thoughts. And, yeah, it might be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, find, I find that that's, I mean, it's a big part of, I think, how I approach my work is just what is this about and let that drive. Because you can shoot any scene any way. And so, but that's not the point. Like the, the point is, this is, you know, a, a film about loneliness or this is a film about family. And so, okay, well, what does that mean? Family is warmth. Okay, so that means maybe when the family's together, that means maybe that the dinner table is warmer. Literally, the color temperature is warmer and it feels cozy. But then when they're out in the world, it's cooler and lonely or handheld or, you know, it, it can very quickly lead your decisions. And that's how I like to work. I think that there's, there should be reason behind your decisions. Do you put a metaphysical element to a lot of... I try, yeah, yeah, I try, yeah, for sure. I've got a lot of hippie in me, and so I love, you know, the because it's still, ultimately you're looking for emotional reactions to things. You wanna create emotional reactions from the audience. And so I think like letting, letting the whole thing be ethereal if it needs to be. Like I, I often, the way, when I'm starting a new project, Often, I don't know what it wants to look like or feel like. 
and I'll just start going through images, images and films and music and just gather and, and you know, with the director or an actor, whoever else are the creatives involved is I, I just like to gather and, and going back to the soup metaphor, it's just like, well, okay, you don't like carrots. All right, so let's not put any carrots in this soup. And it's like, okay, well, do you like a spicy soup? Oh, sp okay, so let's start adding. And, and slowly, it really, do it doesn't feel like I'm making decisions. It really does often feel like the project is slowly revealing itself to me. When it's working really well, it does feel like there's a, a magic to it and that the, the project almost already exists somewhere or like it's a little creature somewhere and it's just slowly, you're like, oh, I think this creature is furry. I think it's got a blue tint to it. And it just like, it, it starts to make sense visually, which is, it's a weird way to think about it, but I find so pleasurable because it feels like I'm hunting for something and then slowly you start to see glimpses of it. And I love that. Do you like things to be a challenge in a sense? Yeah, I, well, it's interesting. I, if I'm not, if I'm not, maybe instead of challenged, it's if I'm not engaged in some way, like I'm, I'm feeling like I'm adding something to it and I'm, I'm working towards something, I can get bored for sure. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not attracted to things that are just like, oh, you know, it's fine, it's whatever. You just kind of put a light on this side and we'll shoot it and we'll figure it out. Like I, I get bored, I definitely get bored. So I, maybe I do need to get challenged. I at least need to be engaged. I need to find something to hook me in. There have been and there have been projects that have come my way that I was like, this is just not a good fit. I'm not, this isn't something I'm interested enough in. I want to make sure I'm interested because it's just so much time. This is your life, you know, you're going to spend half a year uh, working on this thing. So half a year of your life, like, it'd be nice if you care in some way, one way or another. What's it like to shoot an average seven to 10 pages a day? Yeah, so shooting, shooting seven to 10 pages a day is, is how a lot of TV goes. That's one of the things I'll look at often um, is sometimes when I'm being interviewed for a job uh, or close to being hired, sometimes by then they have uh, a page count and a number of shooting days. And one of the first questions I will ask is like, how many, uh, how many pages a day are we shooting? Because it will tell me some element about how hard this job is going to be. Uh, I shot a show that we were averaging, I think we were averaging over 10 pages a day. And it sucks. It's, you're just like, okay, like just put up one light somewhere and you're just going and, and number of characters. That's actually secretly that almost dictates more than because I've noticed, uh, yeah, number of shooting days versus number of pages versus number of characters. Because if there's one person that you're shooting, there are only so many shots of one person you need to do. But if there are eight people in a room and it's even just a two page scene, but everybody needs their own coverage, I shot, I, I shot a show, um, I shot two seasons of a show that has, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13 main characters and sometimes they all get together for dinner and it is a nightmare of 180 lines and where, and it is, it's really, I'm glad, it, in hindsight, I'm glad I've done it because now I feel like I have a good handle and approach on those, but those are really difficult scenes. And so two pages with 12 actors is harder than 10 pages with two actors. So that, so it's an interesting added dynamic. It's like exponentially more difficult for every additional character that's in a room. Unless you have a director uh, who's very intentional and like, sure, sure, there are, sure, there are 11 people in here, but only this person matters. And when they have the the fortitude to just stick with that and actually all we really need is a show, shot that pushes in here and maybe a wide or that's great but usually everybody wants to cover their butt 
And so they're like, well, we're going to need a close up here and close up. And they generally people, which bums me out, but they, every line of dialogue that's spoken by anybody, they're like, well, we have to get that in this shot. It's like, well, you don't have to actually. And most of the great filmmakers don't bother with that. It's, it's again, it's intention. It's what's the scene about. It's not about every person, hopefully, though sometimes it is. Uh, it's it's a, usually focused in on one or two people, their dynamic, and you're trying to capture that. And so you let that lead your decisions. But yeah, if it's if it's high number of pages that you're shooting per day, uh, it's challenging. It's really hard, and uh, I I do not enjoy it. The lower the number of pages, I mean, it's similar to setups. If if it's fewer pages, they're going to be shot better. They're going to be it's going to be more cinematic or more intentional. Um, and if it's a high page count. I hope I get another job offer then because it's it's tough. It's exhausting. And you, and it really the really what gets sacrificed first is uh, the light. Your light you just can't you can't shape the light as much because you need to look generally so many different directions. And so it's a lot trickier to be intentional about your lighting. How many times do you read a screenplay before you step on set? That's a really good question. Whenever, yeah, it's funny. Whenever I start a new project and uh, and it's you know I get this the the script, I always think I'm going to read it a million times. I think I'm going to read it every night, and inevitably, other things come my way, and I end up not reading it as many times as I want. Uh, but that said, I read scenes, so I won't read it beginning to end that many times. You know, a few times certainly right at the beginning. Um, but then it re really becomes, it very quickly turns into a puzzle. So it's almost like you're given the puzzle all as a finished piece, and then almost immediately you break it up, and then it's little puzzle pieces. And you're like, okay, this one we're going to do on day 17, this one, and you almost separate it out. And so, it, and so I'll read the scenes a number of times, but as a whole, I might not revisit it again it's very it's strange but also in tv there are rewrites happening all the time so you have to reread because there are new drafts coming and sometimes this has not happened much but it has happened where there's a, a rewrite that happens and you're in week nine and there's a rewrite and i will have missed an email or something and i won't realize and we'll be on set and be like, oh, this is where they walk out to the kitchen. You're like, no, 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 they go to sleep. I remember this. And like, no, no, in the rewrite. Now it goes, and you're like, oh, no, like I didn't. And so you scramble and it sucks when that happens, but it does happen. TV and different shows, you know, some shows are rewriting as you're on set. I mean, Pen15 has a lot of improv, which is a little different, but they will improvise and as we're doing it, we'll realize, oh, this affects a scene that we have to shoot next week, or this affects a scene we've already shot. So the whole thing does need to be in my head pretty well. So it's, uh, I guess the answer is I never read it enough. Um, I always think I'm going to read it more, but it's always close. I'm always, if I have a minute, uh, especially on the day, the morning of, I reread the scenes that we're shooting for the day for sure to refresh. But then I also try to look at, for every scene that you're shooting, you look to either side of it. Like, where did we just come out of? And then what are we going back into? Because that affects your first and last shot in a sequence too. Because you want it to, you don't want it to be jarring when it cuts to the next thing. So you're, you're trying to hold a lot in your mind. Do you take any notes or storyboard? when you're going through a script? Yeah, I don't storyboard when I'm reading a script, um, but I do take notes. I take a lot of notes on, but it's, it's especially at the beginning, it's very loose. It, it's whatever occurs to me. Like sometimes that's an actual shot. I'll write down, oh, slow zoom in or big wide or, you know, what, whatever, whatever that is, or get a close up of the scissors, anything, whatever that for what, if it strikes me, but, um, Often, and sometimes it's it's something a little broader, like um, oh, handheld. Maybe this is a handheld moment, or maybe this is static, or maybe 
some it's rare at the beginning but sometimes like a color might occur to me something really i'll let myself jot down anything and then i'll let future me decide if that's relevant or not but i do take notes um i don't storyboard and i have rarely worked with directors who storyboard unless it's a commercial because it's so much smaller it's much easier um, or if there's a difficult sequence difficult can be maybe it's an action sequence um, or it's just you know like let's say four people in a car can get very confusing and so sometimes I'll have directors who will storyboard because they want to make sure like oh this and like that everything is kind of intentional um, but usually it's shot lists and so it'll be a list of like you know wide medium close up on her we need to zoom for this moment and it's a list and that's kind of your guide and your map and very often uh, that all changes on the day maybe because an actor goes a certain way or maybe because you have a new idea but having that plan goes a long way and even if you never use a single shot it means you know because there are going to be days where you're not feeling it where you're not like you're just whatever the actors are out of it or the director's out of it or I'm out of it and then you know you have something to fall back on that will still work like this is still going to this is this is still a recipe that in the end you have a scene so I think it's really important to have that really important to plan and talk that out but then on the day always being ready for something better and or if just something changes dramatically you lose a location or whatever uh, I think being able to to improvise is really valuable do you come up with your own shot list or do you always leave that up to the director generally the director brings a shot list um, very often we do that together that's the ideal is that a director and I um, the really the best what I find is is the best way it's just generally not practical is to be able to go with the director to a location and be up on your feet and actually like walk around use the phone as a little like take pictures we'll do that um, that is that's the ideal rarely do you have time to go ahead of time with a director to a location usually you have to pay for locations whenever you're there so um, but yeah generally it's with a director you sit through each scene and you talk it out and you're kind of imagining how you know actors might move in the space and what moments do you need um, but sometimes a director will just come with their own shot list that they've done on their own and then I look through it we talk through it maybe I have suggestions really where I uh, I think one of the strengths that I have is on the day because you're always battling time is watching the directors and actors walk through a scene when I can see it up on its feet I can often figure out a way to combine two or three shots into one like oh if she starts here and then she walks to there and I slide the camera here then we'll actually get both of those shots on your list like that's that's something that I think is very helpful for time but also you know trying to cut down on the number of shots just for for you know to try and control the edit a little bit to tell the story uh, again with intention is that it's like well instead of just get putting the camera here and then putting it here and putting it here and putting it here it's like maybe we can travel maybe this actor's move can pull the camera and now you're in a new setup that gets you this other thing that you you wanted uh, so but it's a, it's a combination for sure and different directors some are better at shot listing some are worse some hate it some love it uh, and so I have to be kind of amenable to all of that yeah. how much do you plan out the day before your shoot the ideal is that every day is very well planned out uh, and that doesn't mean it won't change because it will change but the ideal is that way now that said uh, sometimes working on series you don't get time to prep with the directors some directors come in and let's, let's say they're doing episodes four and five and they you know you've hopefully met them but even sometimes 
you're meeting them on the day and they're coming in and they've done their own prep that's separate from you and you try to do your best to to work with them and i know on bigger shows that happens a lot like the csis of the world directors come in and out and they don't get a lot of time with their cinematographers and that's that's got to be scary that has to be very challenging um, i've been lucky enough that that's rare for me usually i get some time with them but uh very often I, they will a director will come in with a plan that I have never seen before and then I will depending on their comfort level um, I will try and make that fit like our location a little more or the feel of the show because I've been shooting it for a while so I'm like oh normally we won't zoom here or nor whatever that is so it's yeah it varies it, and it's it's and then there are, I have worked with directors where there, we just have a good rhythm and we just kind of wing it, you know, like we, we show up on the day and I'm pretty good at, if I have actors and a director and all that, I can figure out what shots create a scene for sure. So, but that's taken years of shooting shows for sure. But at this point, I feel pretty comfortable with that. How do you know an actor is the real deal? I suppose, like anything, uh, there are many different ways uh, for actors to be, you know, quote unquote, good or bad. Uh, and, you know, I think you can, I've started to think about them a little bit like athletes. And, you know, some work harder than others. Some have some natural talent. Um, but there are also specialty kind of approaches like uh, uh, let's say like a a quirky actor you know like a specialty three-point shooter it doesn't mean that this person is good at all the things but cast correctly casting I guess is really part of it uh, if they're in the right spot you put them in a position to succeed so one person can really shine if they're in the right role and it's a well-written role, of course. Whereas that same person you could see on a different set on a different day in a different role and you're like, ooh, I don't know about that. Like it's, so there are a number of factors. That said, every once in a while, and I would not know how to, to quantify it, but every once in a while I find myself behind the camera and I'm watching something, I'm like, oh, this person's gonna be around forever. Like, the, you, you, there's just something, um, you know, I mean, I guess back in the day you would think of that like, oh, they've got it. You know, I, I hesitate to put it that way, but that said, I have seen that. I've seen actors where you're like, oh, like that's amazing. I had, I had the good fortune of working with um, Matt Damon on, on a tiny little like a YouTube thing I, I watched George Clooney work um, and they are so prepared and so comfortable. There's like a confidence that they carry with them. They uh, treated everybody around them uh, phenomenally well. They were very loose, but then when it came to time to work, they could snap right in. You could tell they had done the work. So all, all of this stuff, whereas other actors come, they don't know their lines. Uh, and so I think part of it is just preparation, truly. And on set, that comes across as like, wow, they're really talented. But really, it's just that they put in the work. Uh, so I think that's part of it. But, you know, I, I, I often find myself surprised when I'm on set and it's time to do a scene and this person's been around and then all of a sudden the camera's rolling and this like they morph into something else so I don't know where some of these things come from uh, I know some of it is work is prep but some of it that maybe there is just a natural thing I don't know I don't know it's a little bit of magic I think I don't know and I, I continue to wonder the same thing but, yeah what other qualities are you looking for in an actor you know it's interesting, so for me, because I have no power over choosing an actor um, in my position as a cinematographer, the actors are, are chosen, so whoever's there, like I'm gonna do whatever I can do with them. Uh, 
there are little treats that some actors bring. Um, there are some actors who just physically, their eyes will catch a light really well. They have like big or big brown eyes, let's say, and they just almost no matter where they are, they'll always catch a little bit of light. And then some actors, their eyes are a little like deeper. I think I have kind of smallish eyes and it can get tricky because like an eye light can go a long way uh, when you're lighting somebody in terms of creating an empathy. There's something really magical about an eye light. And some actors, it's hard to get the eye light. You're like trying to find the spot and some of them won't take it. So I mean, that's a, that's a purely physical thing that they have no control over. So there are like treats like that. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this, and you know, skin tones, different actors they have. You're just like, oh, this like takes the, 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 the warmth really well. So there are little things like that. But a, um, I mean, I guess as with most people on a set, there really is to somebody being um, kind and professional being prepared. That's a, actually preparation is maybe one of the biggest things because we I've a number of times in my life we I have with a director we plan this shot where we're, oh they're going to take them out the door, we're going to dolly all the way down and then they sit here and then they're going to interact with this person and get in their car and go. And then the actor can't get through their lines and you have to reapproach the entire scene and do it because somebody doesn't know their lines. And sometimes that's hard because they have a ton of lines and that's brutal. I wouldn't be able to do that. But sometimes it's a lack of preparation. So I guess, yeah, I suppose for all the, all the random things I just named, I want a prepared actor, somebody who's taking it seriously because like it, it affects my ability to do a good job if somebody comes in unprepared. So I think something as basic as that is about all you can ask from somebody is don't be a dick and be prepared. That's, that goes a long way. So if someone is not prepared, mm -hmm. then you're doing numerous retakes, people are reading them their lines? Mm -hmm. It's const Yeah, there's, there's constant, like you have to reset, you have to take it all in pieces, and if they can only get a few lines at a time, it means you have to cut to something else, because in the edit, you need, when they're, when they're resetting, you have to cut, so it's forcing your hand in an edit and you have to rethink the way you're building a scene which can mean this is not the way we intended or this isn't this isn't going to feel the way we want this to feel uh, but you have to you know because and and look that i say that as though it's really easy that you know you're doing a shoot especially if there's you know one or two lead characters and they have to memorize lines for 15 weeks every day and the scripts are being rewritten it is a big ask that is a big load that these actors are carrying like it really i i empathize with them it's really hard acting is i know we all tend to think of it as like oh celebrity and you're famous and you're it is brutal it is hard work especially if you're on a tv show scripts are changing you have tons of dialogue and then on top of that you have all these people whispering in your ear. I have to gauge when we do it, let's say we're shooting a scene and an actor, you know, on top of all their lines, maybe a director gives them, oh no, this part, don't forget, you need to be sad in this little thing, but then come back up. But then for me, I maybe need an actor to land in a certain spot and maybe they haven't. And I will have to gauge, going back to reading the room, if they seem overwhelmed, I won't give them that note on the first take. I will like let them get a little more comfortable. And then if I can do anything on my side to adjust, maybe we tweak a light, maybe I move my camera, then I'll do that. Otherwise, I'm waiting until they're comfortable and then as gently as I can, I'll just be like, hey, don't forget, like after you get up from the dinner table, I need you to land in this area. And I have to be very careful because I am lower priority you want the performance to to work if the performance doesn't work it doesn't matter how pretty my light is you want the performance to lead so for me i have to make sure an actor is comfortable and that they feel comfortable with me and then gauging when they're too overwhelmed or or it's okay now to give them a no or sometimes you know some directors 
prefer me to give notes, sometimes I go to the director and I say, hey, you need to remind them that they have to get to this area and things like that. So there are lots of little things that actors are constantly being bombarded with. It's, it's, so I think for, for a cinematographer or a camera operator, uh, it's really important to have empathy and realize that these actors, even if you don't like them, they are carrying a lot and you need to protect them and their space, their head space and the physical space that you're working in. Yeah, that's why I always, and I've, I've said this numerous times, but when people say, oh, well, so-and-so doesn't want to hang out in between takes and they just go back into their dressing room. Oh, yeah. But I think that they would need that time. Oh, man. There's, I would not, I would definitely not hang out in between takes. Like, there's no way. There's just so much. And people, you know, especially if um, an actor has any kind of celebrity, people get a little, you know, googly-eyed and a little, and they want to interact. They want to be able to go home to their spouse and just be like, you know, I was talking with George Clooney about chicken today. But they are, there's so much going on for them. So I do my best to like, just stay out of their way because there's, there's really, a lot of people are really pulling at actors' attentions. Same with directors too. But it, they don't have usually that the celebrity attached, and people get, you know, people get weird around celebrity, unfortunately. Yeah. How do you know if a director is the real deal? He yeah, had directors are directors are kind of the the biggest wild card uh, on a set in terms of well, it's close between actors and directors, but a director dictates so much of how a job goes for me um, it's a bit and it's a big part of why I will say yes or no to a job for sure is the director uh, boy well I think going back to something we talked about earlier is I need to feel engaged and creatively engaged and if I'm not it might not be the right job for me um, and the director is usually who dictates that. And because, and sometimes that's because they want a ton of control. Sometimes it's because they don't know what they want at all. Um, or maybe their aesthetic is very different from mine. Uh, so I don't know that I'd think of it as like a good or a bad director. It's more about like a, a match. It's, I mean, it's almost like a, romantic partnership you know it doesn't mean if you if you are dating somebody it doesn't mean it's that they are good or bad it's just how well do you mesh with them how how are your how does your communication work what is your taste what are you trying to get to when you're working on something so i it really does feel like a romantic partnership in a way because it's it's pretty intimate and you are relying on each other and you're going to be around each other in um, very stressful situations when you're tired, you're hungry, you know, things aren't working out. How do you react? How do they react? Um, and can you, and I've been very fortunate. I, I've, I get along with most of the directors I work with, but I absolutely have had directors that I can tell like aren't very fond of because there's you know my own joy and happiness and sometimes the project itself that can only bring so much joy or happiness but the the there are directors that like i'm like oh this just isn't isn't going great like it's just not working out and i and i do think my job is to serve them for the most part and so i try to do my best but it doesn't always work but it yeah it's it's I don't know. There's a weird chemistry. You try to gauge up front as best you can. Will this be a good match? But, you know, until you're in the trenches with somebody, you don't know how it'll be. What's the mark of a professional, a professional director that maybe a newer director, someone a little more green, won't have as many traits or practices, habits? Yeah. You know, directing is such an interesting one. There's a, there's a, joke that you'll hear sometimes on set like who who has the least amount of experience on a set and almost always it's the director it's it's just the nature of getting to a directing position can be very you know 
sometimes it's who you know, sometimes you wrote a script and you're you're being, you know, who who knows? And I think one of the things that's that has to be the most challenging for a new director or an inexperienced director is there's this big machine moving. And at this point, for somebody like me, like I have a lot more to learn, but I've been doing it for a long time. And so when we're looking at a scene and an actor's like, oh, I, actually, I don't wanna sit here. I wanna get up and I wanna go by the, stand by the window, is for some directors, that might freak them out completely. Um, they because they they don't know they've made a plan and then as soon as something breaks in the plan be that an actor's decision or maybe bad weather or a location falls through or there's an equipment malfunction is the ability to change and still you know whatever that intention of the scene is is that you can still find it but using none of what you planned and i think for a newer director that's got to be so hard is finding you know for me one of the things I'm good at is, uh, I think I'm good at at least, is sequencing. Like in a scene, it's like, okay, well, we don't need this close up because we're gonna come around and when the, when she walks through here, this shot will land, so we'll have that line dialogue here. And then we need a B cam shooting. Or like I can very quickly piece together, like, okay, da -da -da, this is all the, okay, yeah, we'll have all the pieces. And a lot of directors can't do that. They they just just simply by because of you know not being not having shot as much um, so it doesn't mean necessarily good or bad but that ability to think on your feet i think is one of the most valuable things especially for tv because it's so fast paced or lower budget feature you 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 just can't stop you have to go 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 and i think that's probably that's probably one of the biggest things and and I don't know I don't know how to like advise a director exactly on because some of it is just hours just putting in just doing it doing it more and learning so you know so I guess going back to similar to my job or an actor's job is preparation is knowing that they know what a scene or a whole piece needs to feel like or be like and then the ability to improvise i guess if you're too rigid and then something falls apart will you be able to adjust i guess that's and maybe not and maybe you know there are directors like david fincher who are just like he is going to get what he wants the way he wants it you know so it's not like being precise is wrong it's just on the sh shows i've been on you can't like you can't get everything perfectly and so how do you still make it work yeah generally speaking what's an appropriate amount of time a director should give a cinematographer to light a scene hmm. uh you know in terms of time to light a scene there's definitely no answer because so like no no strict answer because it all depends on the size of a shoot um and maybe the better way to think about it is how much time do you need do they do the actors need because you the more time i take to to light the less time actors have to act the fewer takes a director gets to direct so that's all part of the factor and then also how many scenes do you have that day you know, if you're in one location for the day and it's one time of day, one mood, then I can take a lot more time at the beginning of the day because we're never moving. But if we have to do three location moves that day, we need to, we need to start shooting as soon as possible. So it's kind of a big math problem because I could light a scene for two years. Like there's no such thing as like, okay, I'm done now it's perfect i could go forever and so the things that cause me to be like all right it's good enough or whatever is, is what else is in play and and you know there's an ad somewhere nearby that, that is like hey are you done like there, there's somebody generally around but it really depends on the scale because you know if you you can light a scene with no lights if you do the right time of day in the right location. 
uh, that's it. You just, if you plan it out, you're like, if we are here at 7.30 and the camera's ready to go, we need to shoot at 7.30 because by 8.30, the light's no good anymore. And then we have to come in and supplement it and that'll take a whole hour or whatever. So, so every scene is a little different. Um, you definitely fall into rhythms. Uh, you know, last show I shot, um, the beginning of the day is always slower because people are unloading equipment and all that. But we would block through a scene and then, you know, I talk to the director and the AD and I I'll, will kind of run through, okay, we need seven shots for this scene. And I'll be like, okay, well, this side, I need 40 minutes, let's say, to light this. But then we have a turnaround and I need to reset the light for that. And so that means that's going to be another maybe 20 minutes. And so it's every scene, every day, every location, every shot is kind of its own animal, honestly. So it's you have to be constantly thinking about that. But it's, yeah, just varies anywhere from zero minutes to, you know, a day of lighting, truthfully. Like it could it can really be anywhere in between. Yeah. Have you been on set where it's been, you know, six hours worth of lighting one shot? Well, so there are scenes, if there is a scene uh, where, for instance, like a long one-er, like a steady cam that goes through a restaurant. We did that on the, my last show. There's a steady cam shot that starts in a parking lot. It comes into a restaurant, goes in through the kitchen back out through the rest of the restaurant into another room where then there's a whole family waiting for them. So I don't so what we did is we basically lit the whole restaurant and the outdoor parking lot and that took I mean I don't remember but it's probably half a day um, but then it meant that we were mostly lit. So not only did we do that steady cam shot, but then you jump into doing your dialogue scenes and the light, you kind of, you sort of light 360. And so in theory, you can point any direction and you can shoot. Now, ideally you are able to tweak this and that, but um, yeah, for if you, if you can capture a lot of material or light a whole space, that's something I try to do when I can is lighting a space uh, a little more because then it allows you like, okay, we've gotten these shots, but now we bump in here, we don't need to tweak the light. Oh, we turn here, we don't need to tweak the light. Now that's hard uh, and it's hard to make look good, but um, that is that is one way of approaching it. So a lot more time up front, but then you just crank. How do you decide when to move the camera and when not to move the camera? Yeah, moving the camera is, it's interesting because, and, and often the director and I will discuss, you know, in pre-production, because some, um, some directors or projects want uh, constant movement. That maybe it's like a light float, but that it's just always moving in some capacity. And then uh, on other projects or other directors, it's like, no, only moves when it's a very specific and important beat. Uh, I've had shows where we didn't move the camera, period, and I've had shows where it's never still. And so it really just, it, it so depends on the project and the director, really, because some of it's just taste. And, you know, I will have my own takes on it. Like, uh, if I feel like, well, moving in this scene, this is such a, this, this character's really sad and, if the camera's moving around, it's gonna feel too sexy or too exciting. And maybe because it's always moving, maybe now it being static is going to accentuate that because we're used to it moving and vice versa. So context really dictates all of it, but you do want there to be a reason. Not, even if it's a show where everything's moving, why is it always moving? You don't like, it's tricky when, when the reason is, Oh, it's just cool. Like, it's it's not that that's wrong. There's no right or wrong, but for me, again, thoughtfulness is so important to me. Like, why are things happening? And if the reason is because it's cool, like, 
that's not wrong. You know, I, it's just less exciting. It's harder for me to sink my teeth into that. And I think uh, I can get lazy. I, you know, if it's just like, well, there's no, I'm just kind of sliding the camera around. Then I, if I'm not thinking about what I'm doing, uh, you know, by, by day three, I'm just like, what, what am I doing here? So, so it's, it's tricky, but you know, you want, you want traveling with like, uh, something that David Fincher going back to Fincher, something he does because he's, he's a, his style of filmmaking freaks me out a little bit because it's so controlled and I get nervous. Like, would I even be able to survive a David Fincher shoot? I don't know. But his camera tends to lock into actors. If actors are moving, the camera's moving and they're in sync. And that's pretty impressive. Like when somebody's getting up and sitting down, the camera, but that takes, you know, he does a hundred takes of stuff. Like it, that's hard. That's really hard work. Uh, but that's an approach that makes sense is if actor moves, camera moves. If actor's still, camera's still. Uh, but there is just, you know, there is everywhere. I mean, a Michael Bay thing, camera's always alive, but that's because he wants it all to be a roller coaster ride. And so it's not, again, it's not wrong. It's just like, that's the, that's the aesthetic. So I guess it starts from a vision and then hopefully the camera's movement or lack thereof, it, 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 at least there's like a string connecting it to that original vision and again, intention. Did you see Uncut Gems? I did. Yes, that's it. Yeah, Uncut Gems, constantly moving camera, which makes per that ca that character is constantly moving. So yeah, that's a perfect example of something that like there's a reason for that, and then it's just like go 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 because it's a whirlwind. His whole life is a whirlwind. Yeah, especially in the jewelry store oh. or out on the street. Yeah, it was just constant and and it, and. It, it, I think it, it worked so well for that film and it, was, yeah. it really conveyed who he was as a character, what his world was like. Yeah, yeah that's actually a much better example because I know Michael Bay brings a lot of, like people have a lot of associations, but Uncut Gems is a great example of constant camera movement for a reason and very effective. It feels very chaotic. Yeah, that's great. What tools or equipment should a beginning cinematographer buy early because they're going to be using them all the time? That's a good question. I think, you know, if you can get a fast lens, I think that is a very useful tool, a lens that can, you know, opens up to a, at least a two, let's say. Well, I'd say two eight is a good minimum, but if you can get something like these Rokinons I mentioned, those are a 1.5 or something. Uh, I think a fast lens is a very valuable tool for a couple reasons. One you can shoot in lower light situations. So it just, just helps when you don't have a lot of gear, but also it can sh teach you uh, about depth of field because you can get to the extreme and you can see what a very shallow depth of field can do for you, which, but also a deep depth of field. So I think that's one of the, I would probably start there. And then beyond that, you know, I think it's, it's getting easier now, but like a strong light, but those are hard to find cheap. But a strong light source, I've noticed, if you can have a strong light source coming in a window, it gives you such a great baseline to start from. But usually a bigger light is something that requires a bigger crew and more money. So that's maybe a little more wishful thinking. Uh, there's an app called Sunseeker, and I think there are a couple other versions, but it can tell you, you know, uh, where the sun will be at any time of day on any day of the year. And if you can really choose those spots, I use it for 100% of the spot, unless I'm in a set where, where there are no windows, uh, I wanna know where the sun is gonna be and when, and then I'm gonna use that to decide what direction we face and what time of day we want to shoot there. So I think that that's an indispensable tool as far as I'm concerned. It's kind of expensive, but uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. And actually along those lines, there's an app called Artemis, which you can put in any camera and any set of lenses, and it will 
ingest that and then you can take it you can be like oh i want to see on an alexa mini 50 millimeter from this position that's what this will look like oh actually no we're shooting a different camera which is going to be a black magic it's going to be a, the 6k pocket cam and we we only have a 40 millimeter you plug it in and same thing so you can really get a sense of what each lens is going to show you in a space so i think those are those are i mean i use both of those tools constantly on every set I've been on for sure. So I think those are huge. Um, yeah, I think those are those would be the big ones. Yeah. Anything maybe hold off on? It's not as necessary. Well, I you know I think we have um, we all have obsessions with cameras like camera brands, and I think nowadays especially. Uh, what you can get with a $1,000 camera blows my mind. And I think, you know, there are benefits to cameras like an Alexa or, or a Red or whatever. They all have, they all have their advantages, but uh, not feeling like you have to get a high-end camera to shoot a high-end image, uh, that is not the case anymore. I would say um, one thing, if your camera does not have internal ND filters, neutral density filters, one piece of gear that I think you do need are neutral density filters. And they have nowadays a bunch of different brands of um, variable NDs. And that's something that you can screw on to the end of a lens and you can twist it and it will um, allow more or less light into your camera. And there are a number of reasons that that's beneficial, but ideally it allows you to start being conscious about shooting at certain f-stops. It gives you control. So like shooting, um, you know, I've shot shows where we're really opening up and it's a shallower depth of field, a little aimed more toward beauty and you're shooting at like a, a two or for a lot of it. But then there are other times where I'm like, no, we're going to shoot at a four and it's deeper depth of field and it feels different. But you, you don't have that control unless you have a uh, neutral density filter. So that's something to get. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I think not obsessing about quality of your camera. I think that's something that we all get hung up on. But the, the, what you can get now, is it's, it just boggles my mind. It's unbelievable. So I think the, the, the floor has come up so high in terms of the floor of your image is always going to be pretty good now in terms of what the camera can give you at least. So yeah, not obsessing about an expensive camera is probably a big thing. Can you dispel the myth? Can you really fix it in post? <laughs> I hate fixing it in post. I am not a believer in fixing it in post. For one, it will often not get fixed in post because just like in production, when you run out of time and money, people run out of time and money in post. And so a lot of things end up just getting tossed by the wayside. Um, and you know, it's important to know when you can fix something. If you're, you know, you're on set and you're running out of time and you're, you're the sun is going down, it's like, well, we're almost out of light, but we can still shoot this. But in post, they're going to have to pull it up. It's not going to look as good, but you know the range. It's like we can get it to a certain. So sometimes out of necessity, but I I hate fixing it in post. I I think it's when you start hearing that, which you will hear all the time, and I will say it sometimes, uh, but that should never be where you land if you don't have to. And then when you have to, that's the beauty. You can do so much in post these days, but you shouldn't set out with that as your initial attitude for sure. You've been asked to do a commencement speech at a college. Mm -hmm. What are your final words to young cinematographers, upcoming generation of filmmakers, cinematographers? Yeah, you know, I never would have guessed this, and I, I touched on this earlier, but Coming into this industry, I never would have guessed how far kindness can get you, being pleasant to work with. People are, I've gotten, I don't know what other cinematographers do, but a lot of them apparently it's not good. Because the amount of times that different departments, specifically art department, but well, no, and sound and costume, 
that will come up to me. And I'm not, I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm just a normal person. The amount of times that departments come up to me, I'm like, Andy, you're so nice. I love working with you. It feels like they've been abused puppies that somebody's now giving them a biscuit. Like I'm not, so for me, and I, same with producers. I've had producers tell me outright that the reason that they rehire me is because of the atmosphere I create on set. Not the visual atmosphere, just the vibe. And I never would have thought that that would get me work. That never even occurred to me. I'm thankful that that's true. It's, it's been good for my career. But I think remembering that this is your life, like the way you spend your day to day is your life. And when you're on set, if you suck to be around, if you're unpleasant to be around, that is not going to serve you. And what an amazing gift that being nice and happy can be good for your career. Like that, that feels too good to be true, but that's exactly what I've found. And so I think embracing film has opened me up as a person, got me to be more confident, less shy, because I love it so much. And if it's also teaching me to meditate and be kinder, I never yell. I never, ever yell on set. I want to yell, but I don't. It's teaching me to like control my emotions. Don't blow up. Be patient. That's, I, I just, it, it's, it brings me so much joy to think that being better at my career makes me a better person and being a better person makes me better at my career. So I would think that's the best piece of advice is allow your goodness as a person to help you be a better craftsman better to work with. Everybody wants that, I would assume, in every field. You said you went on some road trips um, after 2009. You know, you kind of, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you didn't really have that much weighing you down. And, mm -hmm. and you, what did you see on some of these road trips? Yeah, I, I'm the big, there was some quote that somebody once told me that Akira Kurosawa said, and then I've tried to find it and I've never found it. So I have no idea. Somebody just said it to me, but um, to be a good filmmaker, live an interesting life. And I spent a good chunk of my late 20s and early 30s living a weird life on the road. I was traveling. I slept on couches. I slept in cars. I slept on the grounds. Like I was, I was adventuring. I was, I was living a life and I was, um, looking at the world around me, like literally just looking at the world. Uh, part of that is looking at light, but part of that seeing, you know, mountains in the snow versus desert in, in the summer versus, you know, the, the seeing an ocean, a quiet lake, a busy city. These all have a feeling to them and emotion and having that experience, you never know what kind of script will come your way and what you'll be able to touch on. And then ultimately, people is to to connect with strangers a stranger on a bus in the middle of italy or you know wherever to to connect with different people or just watching people i think that just gives you it gives you a richer life which then gives you a richer palette to pull from when you're coming up with ideas so i i really am a big believer now i do wonder sometimes had i maybe started my career a little earlier would I be further along now? But what I did in my late 20s, early 30s, this kind of vagabond life was interesting. And I would imagine it's painted my experience, which I bring to my work for sure. So I think making sure I'm a huge film nerd, but living some life outside of movies, I think is a very valuable thing. You know, connect with the world around you as best you can.